All right, so back to it. Guys, welcome to the webinar. In this webinar, I'm going to be showing you the three stages that we're using to not only launch new shirts on a regular basis and do the whole Teespring and viral style and gear bubble thing where, you know, kind of how we did all 2014. It was all about just new launches every week, make more money, all that good type of stuff. Um, but it's really about the long-term system that you can put into place. And I, I really recognize that at the end of 2013 or 14, and especially here in the 2015, just a lot of changes going on all the time in advertising. You know, we were on a very big Teespring bubble there last year. Things were very easy in the beginning of the year, you know, and it got harder as more people come in. And it's you'll see this a lot. There's a lot of bubbles out there in our industry that will have a huge rise. And if you ride the bubble, you can make a lot with it. But that bubble will burst, and Teespring will burst. T-shirts will burst. So we have to have a long-term uh, system in place to find our winners, really dial in those winners, and then continue to sell those winners for 6, 12 months down the road instead of worrying week by week. And that's exactly what our system is here. So I'm going to go through this three-stage process. And like I said, stage one is really about finding those winners, our normal outreach program. Stage two is when we have a winner, we see that we sold 50, 100 shirts or whatever the first round. Then we want to dial it in and really find out who our ideal demographics are, what's in this niche, what can we go with this niche with the audience we've already built, the asset we have, and, and figure all that type of stuff in stage two. And then once we have that information, we can head on to stage three, and this is when we kind of put in the e-commerce, the, e the social media, the email, all that stuff that's going to allow you to sell this shirt for six to 12 months, years down the road, whatever it may be, depending on the, the uh, niche and shirt you got. So let's go ahead and dive in this sucker. I guess let me go ahead and mention before we get started, uh, legal precedents. I don't have anything on the screen here, but you know any income statistics or anything shown, those are unlikely numbers. Majority of people that try this will fail. That does not mean that you're not going to succeed, obviously, but just for legal purposes, I have to mention that. And then also at the end of this, we're going to, I'm going to be selling a four-week workshop where I'm going to be showing you live for four weeks in April every piece of this. Every step you're going to go through, this is what we're going to build right in front of your eyes. Um, any questions unanswered through the webinar will be definitely answered there. I kind of want this to be the end all of my t-shirt products so I don't have to keep creating anymore and I can just tweak this one to continue improving. And uh, so I don't really do a normal webinar style where I'm going to pitch a lot. So you'll probably have like a five minute pitch at the end. If you don't consider it quality content from the webinar, then you know, don't buy. All right, so stage one, finding your winners, the usual system for getting t-shirt sales with Teespring and all those launch platforms. Really what our goal here, well, we're just going to consider it like you have never launched a shirt before, you've never had any success or anything like that. So our goal here is to find a winning design. We're doing this every day of every week of every month, all the time, looking for new designs. We're looking for new niches to branch out our system, really trying to grow an empire where we can dial it in as much as possible. And with these, we're really just trying to tip as many campaigns as possible. Any little bit of profit is awesome here. That's exactly what we want to create. And even today, when the systems like Gear Bubble and Viral Style, they're starting to allow us to uh, collect leads, buyer leads. That means we can even go in in uh, the red a little bit on the front end with these launches, and you'll still be able to make the money up on the back end. And that's really where the power of the long-term system comes into play. And that's why I've been doing the e-commerce, as you'll see in stage three. But there's a lot of platforms that we're using today are going to give us those options. And that's, that's really powerful for us. Um, great, thing, great things are definitely coming. We are in a golden age, like I said, of t-shirts. All these platforms are competing for you. You know, Teespring was the first one. And then Viral Style came along with all the marketing tweaks that we all asked for as marketers. Now represents in the picture. Don Wilson's released Gear Bubble that's coming out in April. That's just absolutely going to be killer. It's adding pretty much everything that we have wanted. Um, kind of like it will go. That's how marketing goes. They're going to make it, uh, you know, very powerful stuff. So things to know in this stage, you know, people that wear T-shirts. If you're going to have a T-shirt that sells, it's going to have to be a passion topic. People are going to have to be passionate about. It. They're going to have to really love what's on their shirt, something to share, something for people to talk about. 
to make them feel unique and show their personality. So the bigger passion you choose, the easier it is to connect with this, this audience. Okay, so the, the more you can connect with that audience, the more passionate they're going to be about wearing your shirt. Now we do this with our shirts with what we call layers. Uh, let's consider a single layer shirt is going to be something like mothers. A mom is very passionate about her child. A grandmother is very passionate about her grandchild. But that's just a single layer, remember. The more layers we use in a shirt, the more we're going to connect with that audience member, the more passionate they're going to be about the topic. So what we want to do, now, now it's not saying that single layer shirts don't sell, but most of all we want to look for two, three layers when we're looking at our shirts, okay? So like, let's think about a double layered shirt. A mom of a swimmer. This is two layers connecting each other, which is a mother who's passionate about her child. She's also passionate that her child likes swimming. So this is two layers we're hitting on. It's going to give you a little bit better chance to connect with that reader. And like I said, the more layers you have, the better it's going to be. So if we go to levels like three, four, five, I know some guys that do seven layers deep when they're advertising and marketing their shirts, and it really tightens down your group of people that are available, but it also makes that passion and that connection with that group so much greater. And you have a solid quality design on hand, you're going to really kill it. People really want their clothing to be unique. You know, they don't want they don't want everyone in the world to wear the same shirt. You know, it might if you have like a swim mom like we were talking about and she has a bunch of other swim moms on her team, that's okay. That's still them feeling unique because they're a tight-knit group. And a lot of the time, what you're doing with marketing, what you're doing with any of these, I mean, if you look at politics, if you look at dating, if you look at anything, it always comes down to an us versus them perspective. So it's a good versus evil type of situation. This is how you kind of can convince people to follow what you say. And it even comes down to when, when you're selling a t-shirt, you're creating an us versus them perspective. The more layers you have, the more that us group feels like it's it's just for them. Oh, this is me. That's what you want them to feel when they see that shirt. And not, oh, this is everyone. You know, that uniqueness is what's going to sell. So, some shirts here. We got some examples that are just some double layers. You know, the more layers, like I said, the more you're going to be connect with them. We have a flogging Molly St. Patrick's Day shirt. They actually just had a concert in San Diego yesterday. Um, but I just saw the shirt on Teespring. And that's two angles combining each other right there. A band and St. Patrick's Day. And we have a uh, running and wine. That's another two double layer uh, shirt that's done well out there. And then we have another where it's cat and wine. So these are just some examples of some multiple layer shirts that, you know, that's how you connect with that group a little bit better than just having that single layer. So when it comes to selling t-shirts, you want to connect with that passionate audience. And this is coming with knowing our niches. Think about social media. What's social? What is really, pa what are people passionate about? Animals, wine, exercise, bands, certain holidays, uh, crazy days like Pi Day, you know, different stuff like that. So that's what you want to be thinking about when you're creating your shirts, when you're thinking about designs. These are just things to keep in mind while you're going through. Um, just some ways to kind of help you sell a lot more shirts. So let's go ahead and jump into our stage one process. Now, like I said, this is the process for finding those winners out there that are going to allow us to dive into the niche deeper find more designs that are going to work for that niche, and then you know sell a lot of shirts. This is We use a the rebrandable method here. Now, I've talked about this quite a bit. Rebranding a, a design pretty much means you're looking for a message that's going to fit a lot of different niches. It's something that you can just change a word or two words or a silhouette or something along those lines, and the, the it's going to, <coughs> it's going to be able to, connect with a different audience just as much as it would another audience. So 
what you can see there is it might not be as a passionate group. We're not getting those multiple layers that are going to really connect. You can't do a seven layer t-shirt across a rebrandable design. That'd be way too intricate probably of, of targeting. I guess you could, but it probably wouldn't do very well. What we're doing with this stage one is we're really casting a wide net. Okay, we're throwing out a lot of designs, we're throwing out a lot of ideas, a lot of niches to find one that's going to catch on for us. And when you don't have a design that's working for you yet or a niche that's really rolling for you, this is very important because you need to get that one niche that you can focus on as soon as possible. Okay, and that's really the goal here is find that one niche that you can sell three, four, five shirts in over the next six months and continue selling all of those because you know that crowd likes them. You know what to give that crowd. And then once you have that one niche, you can simply rinse and repeat this process to find new niches. You know, we started with one niche. Now we're up to about 13 niches that we know we can sell shirts in and go through stage two and stage three and all that good stuff. So the process of stage one is the rebrandable design system. We're wanting to go out. First off, we need to find our design and we need to find our solid niches. Now, where can we look? First off, we can go check out Pinterest. Now, Pinterest.com slash source slash www.teespring.com. This is one of the best source uh, places to look out there because it's just going to connect. It's going to show all of the different shirts people are sharing that has a Teespring link associated to it. So anything that's selling and popular and viral that people are posting on Pinterest, which with any shirt that sells well, you want that happening, we're able to see that on Pinterest. And this really helps us kind of see day-to-day, week-to-week, what's out there, giving us some ideas of what we can we can grab and rebrand it to some niches that aren't hit. You know, we can look out on the web. Uh, Google's a good spot. tview.fatograph.com is another great place to do some research. This is uh, just a site that kind of collects all the winning shirts out there. I think it has like a staff and all that type of stuff um, that just kind of search the web and finds the shirts, adds them on here. It used to be a great source, one of the first sources that I used uh, when doing this, and now it's kind of becoming uh, less useful. The Pinterest.com slash source is really a great spot to go. And also you want to just kind of be aware. Be aware of your, your surroundings. While you're on Facebook and, and looking around, you'll, you'll have shirts advertised to you. So look at what's selling. See what's doing well out there. If you see a design that's doing well, see how you might be able to re reword that or add something different or make it better or you know hit seven layers to it instead of three, You know something like that. You also want to look at bumper stickers. People that, you know, a t-shirt and a bumper sticker are much, much alike. It's They're putting it on their personal possession, which... A shirt is them, they're putting on themselves. A bumper sticker they're putting on their car or their laptop or whatever. But it's still that uniqueness, that passionate feeling of sharing uh, uh, sharing what they love, what they're passionate about. So like I said, just kind of look everywhere. So you know, be aware of your surroundings. And the more shirts that you launch, the more you're going to be aware of what's going on out there, uh, what sells well, things like that. All right, so now what to look for. We're looking for messages, like I said, that can be reworked with a single word, phrase, or silhouette. I showed you just the other day that God grant serenity prayer that we were using, and all it took was adding a new word to the, the very last word of the phrase. Now we added some silhouettes in there and a front-end design that just kind of helped connect with that reader, give it a little bit better design. But we found this by just, I think I found that one just by being on Facebook and I saw an ad to a dog version of that that was very broad. It was a very broad uh, niche, only hitting dogs. I think it was rescue dog owners. And I thought, well, heck, we could do this for all our other niches out there that we run uh, by just changing that word. And it, it works very well. And we do this on a consistent basis. This is always going on every week, every day, while we're also going to head into stage two and stage three in a second. You also want to look at viral social media posts. Look at memes and things that are quotes in the niche. Something that really connects with that, that reader. Remember, like I said, it's about that layer of connection. How are you going to get that message across that person to make them feel passionate and want to share this, this shirt? So that's, you know, that's what social media is all about. People are sharing what they like, what they enjoy, what they're passionate about. So if they're sharing, liking, and commenting on a social media post that has a cool meme or a cool quote or a picture or whatever, that can definitely be turned into a t-shirt. So always be aware of your surroundings. Look what's going out there. 
Um, you know, look for the past winners in broad niches, like I said, kind of like the dog niche, and we can look for a more layer-oriented message where we can hit maybe multiple layers or hit that different, more unique uh, niche angle where dogs, that first one, it was targeting dogs, the God Grant Serenity Prayer, but we could have done individual dog breeds. You could have done pugs, labs, German shepherds, you know, poodles at the end. All of those would have worked out just as well and allowed you to dial it in a little bit more. All right. So let's look at our plan of attack here when we're doing these rebrandable shirts. Now, our goal is to launch at least five shirts per day, every day. And it's only one design. It's one rebrandable designs that we're hitting five different niches, okay? So here's an example we did back in December. Did like, I think like fifty-five, fifty-six thousand dollars $56,000 off of this simple, simple design. Look at that. Rabbits make me happy. You not so much. We All we had to do, this is a Photoshop text image I made myself, every one of them. And I just had to change that first word. It took me about an hour to make about 300 of these. And we just hit every niche out there. Rabbits, volleyball, roofing, good lighting. That you know that was a little something different for the photography niche. Trying to reword it so it's not just the niche makes me happy, but maybe it's something that connects with that niche a little bit more. You know, volleyball, we could have put uh, spot or digs make me happy, you not so much, or you know, another play call of volleyball or whatever it is. So we're looking for a design like this, and we want to hit five different niches that we can reach out to. Because remember I said we're casting a wide net. Not all these are going to work. You know, typically when we do these rebrandal designs and we're not very focused in our niche, we don't know our niche, we're only getting about 15 to 20% success rate, and those are only going to tip, or not even tip maybe, but maybe break even um, and, and not make any money. And we'll get like 5 to 10% of those will make money, and then 1 to 2% of those will make a lot of money. That's kind of how it goes with rebrandable designs, and this is why it's a consistent thing. And we use this rebrandable design system to, like I said, reach for new niches, reach for new designs, and plus this does make money. It just has a ceiling to how much it can make because, because they're not going to connect with the audience as well as a unique niche design will, like I'll talk in a little bit. Now, when I launched the five shirts in a single day, with that one rebrand design, I like to stick in a similar industry. So it would be like on Monday, we'd have five jobs with this. So it would be roofing, uh, forklift driving, uh, carpentry, you know, welding. We'll do five different jobs on Monday. Then on Tuesday, we'd do five different animals, pigs, pugs, labs, cats, you know, all that type of thing, and sports. So they're just kind of three examples of industries that are similar that we can do a big outreach. Okay, so this allows you, like I said, to find those niches, jump into the industries that are going to work. Because typically, if you have something that works, a rebrandal design that works in one industry, like if it works for jobs, one job, if I have a shirt that works for roofing and it's a rebrandal design, it'll probably work pretty well for all the other jobs out there. Now, that's not so much the case if you're crossing over industries. A job rebrandable design might not work as much as an animal rebrandable design. Um, you might be able to reword the, uh, redo the words a little bit, redo the phrase to kind of fit that niche and that angle. But typically, we like to keep it in the same industry so that we can see the connection value and the fact are all there. Now, you have to really keep organized when you're going to be launching shirts like this. I mean, that's 25 shirts a week. And that's not the le That's at least what we're, we're launching. And a lot of them, like I said, do fail. So you got to really keep track of what's going on. So if I launch five shirts to, on Monday and they're on the job niche and all five of them fail out, um, then I know that those five niches are available for Thursday's uh, launch or next Monday's launch. Now, if you have those five designs launched on Monday and two of them work out, let's say the roofing and the carpentry uh, designs work out, then they're going to they're gonna run for a week, two weeks, three weeks, whatever. So you're not going to launch another carpentry and roofing shirt the next week. So you got to really keep track of what's going on. Now, how we schedule is we use teamup.com. This is a free calendar um, browser-based app situation. Have all my guys log in there. Um, and it's just a calendar. We just have our dates going. We'll have a shirt, the name, you know, use the right nomenclature. This one, we'd call it, you know, Rabbit's Happy would be the design. 
We have the date we wanted to run. If it fails on Tuesday, we're not making any money. We shut it off. Then we we drop that date down to that end date where that wherever you stopped the shirt, and then you know rabbits is available for the day after, and and so on. And this becomes important, especially when you start getting niches that are working for you on a regular basis. Because let's say, for example, coal miners. I. I one of my first niches had really good success with in t-shirts and we always have success with them now because we have it dialed in. So we always want a coal mining shirt being launched all the time. If we don't have a new one that's not working, that's fine. Shut it down, but the next day we really want to launch another coal miner just so that we have that money maker always going. So we get these niches dialed in, dialed in. We know we want shirts launching them at all times, and then we have our outreach to find new niches at the same time going on. So that's something to be aware of. Um, now, when you have the rebrand design, we really want to hit our our main niches, our focus niches first, because like I said, the coal miner we have success with it. So when I launch a rebrand design and it has big success in the coal miner niche, then I know it's a, a, a design that will probably sell in other niches. If it doesn't have success in the coal miner niche, then more than likely it's not going to sell for my other job niches at least because I know that one is my best to kind of show me is this a good rebrand design or not. So these are things that you pick up the more shirts you launch, the more successes you have, you're going to be able to kind of dial it into this and use your other assets to, to tell you. So we have every Thursday I have my project lead will come in with 25 design ideas um, or 50 whatever it is for that week and we go through them one by one we plan out the schedule on teamup.com for the next week kind of figure out where we're gonna launch Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday then I have them on Friday just put in the order to the designer and by Monday we have our first load ready to go Tuesday, Wednesday, same thing kind of a just continual pattern. The sooner you can get ahead a good week or two, the better. But, like I said, you're not going to be able to plan ahead two, three weeks just because you will have shirts that fail and you'll have shirts that succeed. So that's going to change up how long you're going to run a shirt, how long it's going to uh, impact your schedule. All right. Where are we going? Yeah. All right, so that's the design and research part of rebrand designs. Like I said, we're looking for that phrase that's going to catch in multiple niches, something that you feel could uh, do well across multiple platforms. Maybe not knock it out of the park. You might not sell 5,000 of one of these designs, but if you sell 500 variations all at 50 copies a piece, that's just as good. It just, it, it just uh, takes a little bit more management, but it's very much worth in the end when we're getting new niches, all that type of stuff. Um, now, as far as launching, this is how we our system goes. First off, we have creating the T-shirt listing. Now, up in this point, we've up until this point, we've mostly only used Teespring. Um, over the past six months, we've been getting more into viral style. Represent just released, and then we have Don Wilson, like I said, is just released uh, or about to release Gear Bubble to the public, which is offering a lot of great. You know perks to the game that had me very excited. Uh, upsells buyers list, you know upsells to coffee mugs and and cell phone designs and all this stuff that we can really improve our system. But right now we'll go through just kind of the Teespring setup of what's going on. Now when you're doing these T-shirt listings, this is something that should absolutely be resource or outsourced because it's just kind of a waste of time to be uploading 25 shirts a week yourself um, when you could easily pay a VA to do this simple step. Um, just by following your outline, uh, like like I do. So things that you want to pay attention to in the creation and the listing area are first off, of course, headline. I keep this very simple. It'll be something like limited edition. I love my swimmer. Okay. Um, or it can be a question. We'll ask a question. Hey, are you a swim mom? Do you love a swimmer? Do you love a miner? Uh, are you a cold-hearted miner? You know, whatever it may be. Questions kind of help, you know, just that marketing presence. Now, headline, we haven't had much difference in conversions. I haven't done much testing even on that for these as far as the words go. But we always have the best success with just limited edition and state the shirt name or we'll ask a simple question. Now, copy, there's two ways to go. You can go with a kind of short copy, where you just go, are you a blah, 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 then this is perfect for you. 
buy now. Or you can go with a longer copy. And this is kind of what we've been using a lot lately. Just kind of give it a little bit more professional feel. <clears throat> Shows them a <clears throat> excuse me, a call to action process, how to order your shirt. If you have trouble ordering, which a lot of times if you're selling a good shirt, you'll get some comments on your ads of, you know, how do I buy this shirt or I haven't received mine or something like that. You know, just this little trouble ordering and we give Teespring's customer support number kind of helps build that trust, I guess, within the, the buyer. <clears throat> Next off, we have what type of styles you should be launching. We've been very big on hoodies and tees, especially over the cold season here. It's been mostly hoodies, just because the profit margin is a little bit more. And really, whatever you show on the front page, whatever you show in the ad, is kind of what's going to sell the most. Um, so uh, sometimes you can change the style you're promoting, and it'll actually do better. You know, some niches. Uh, you know, some niches won't do well with hoodies, and some niches won't do well with tanks. A swim mom will wear a tank top because it's kind of an outdoorsy sporting event <clears throat> where, you know, a coal miner wife might not be as excited about a tank top. It's just not part of their, you know, what their their apparel is. <clears throat> so we have our base products set as tees, hoodies, and long sleeves. Gives them that option. As it's getting warmer here, we're going more to... Basic tees, just kind of the standard, lowest cost one. Sometimes we'll go American Apparel. Sometimes we'll go the women's fitted, um, depending on the niche. But most of the time, it will be the basic tee. We haven't seen really much variation and conversions there. So basic tee or hoodie. And then as a shirt goes off and does well, then we can start promoting the other styles um, to kind of help scale and, and, and improve your reach, as you'll see in stage two. <clears throat> All right, so as far as pricing, this is something we've been changing up often throughout the past year. When we first started, the first shirt I launched on Teespring was a nurse shirt, and we had it priced at $15. And this was, I mean, if you think about it, not very much profit at all. Just a few bucks, you know. I, I think I sold like 70-some of these, and I made $300 off of it. And that was not even profit. That was $300 revenue or so, you know, it's not bringing in much money at $15. Then after that, we saw, okay, let's jump up to $20. Got better better uh, <clears throat> profit per sale, and the conversions didn't drop. So that was pretty cool to see. And then over the last, you know, few months, we've been continually rising up, really seeing that the conversions are the same. Today, we're at $24.95 with our T-shirts. That's our lowest price product at all times. This pretty much brings in around $15 profit per sale. Um, at the lowest, and then we have our our hoodies at like forty nine ninety five. Um, I think we do yeah, our sleeves at twenty nine ninety five, tanks at twenty seven ninety five, women fit twenty seven ninety five, and pretty much what we're doing is we want to make sure that every one of our other options is going to make more profit than our basic low cost tee. Okay, and that's really what we're doing here with our prices. Um, where, like I said, the hoodies and tees are typically our main seller, so as long as we convert there, we're good on any of those extras are going to bring in just as much. <clears throat> now, this is, when you're doing this, it's really you're just doing one campaign. Uh, we go 14 days, pretty much, 10 to 14 days with our first campaign, and... <coughs> This is going to give us enough data to kind of move on to stage two or to say, okay, let's not do this shirt anymore. Let's do the the next design we have or whatever it may be. So that doesn't mean we're not going to sell this shirt for only 14 days. It just means that the first Teespring campaign, if you want to talk about Teespring, uh, would be a 10 to 14 day campaign. Gives us that whole period of the initial burst at the beginning, the middle period where we got to get our ads in there, and then our last day stuff and all that kind of stuff we'll talk about. So that's the simple stuff of creating the t-shirt listing, stuff you guys probably already know. Don't want to get too much into that. Now let's talk about the advertising. When you have these shirts, you know, <clears throat> like I said, we're casting a wide net. So <clears throat> we want to kind of start broader, find our winners, and dial in with our targeting. Um, 
Now, when we're launching so many shirts out there, it does get to be a chore doing all the interest research, looking out there. But once you have it done once on a certain niche, then you really don't have to do the interest research anymore until you have like a really solid winner. Okay. And pretty much how that goes is we we start off with a grouped interest to that are t dialed into our niche, whatever it may be. If it's swimmers, then we're looking at those best interests that would convert a swimmer, things that swimmers are most passionate about. So a swimmer publication, a magazine, or swimmer products and brands, or a minor celebrity that's a swimmer. Those are things and interests that only hardcore swimmers are going to like and be interested in, so they're the only ones that we're going to be able to target with that. Now, as you have a shirt that does very well, you can start to go to those other broad uh, interests, like swimming. That would be a very broad interest that I would not target my swim shirt at, at the beginning, but it's something we can move into. That's pretty much the idea about how we're going to go our advertising and our interest research, as you'll see here. Now, we start with a PP ad, or a PPE ad, and this is a fan page post that you're going to advertise to, get people rolling into give you two examples here <clears throat> so fan page post and what we like about fan page posts and a PPE ad which stands for pay, uh, page post engagement ad is it's going to cause engagement and that's exactly what we're looking for where a big indicator of your success is going to come down to the amount of comments the amount of shares the amount of people that are interacting with the ad not just the people that are visiting your sales page so we like these PPE ads because you're bringing all these shares in and a couple days later you're getting these sales from those people that were that were commented on and said oh you really need this all that type of stuff you know you can see the comments here I love it I'll order it um, I really really want this tagging other people you know different stuff like that and we have a few different variations I'm always testing these as you can see we have a human mock-up going on with our minor one here and then this is kind of our basic that we've always done um, the message is a little different. I've been doing this one a little bit more because I like to tag three people who think you love. Um, seems to get them to tag a little bit more often. So very basic fan page post. Nothing tar hard about that. <clears throat> now you always want to be asking yourself, who do you think is going to like this shirt? Who do you think is going to be a targeted demographic? Like I said, when you're looking at your interests here and you're um, doing the research, Think about those interests that would really connect with the, the buyer. Don't think about the amount of interest you got or the amount of reach. Don't think about that yet. Just think about which ones you think the most hardcore swimmers will like. And it really comes down to getting good at that for your initial ads to take off. Because once you have that group of, of dialed-in interest, pretty much every shirt you launch from in that niche is going to have success. Now you can do that by either just kind of figuring out in your head and thinking about it, which interest you think is going to be best for this niche, or you can separate your interest individually and test them all. But like I said, we're launching 25 designs a week in a lot of niches that we're not a part of and we know nothing about. So that would be a lot of money that we're going to lose. Um, now we definitely do this in stage two because we're going to dial in our demographic, we're going to dial in our niche at that point. But for stage one here, we're thinking broader termed, we're thinking, you know, trying to hit everyone I can possibly reach. Alright, so things we want to think about demographics wise is going to be age. Um, what age is this ideal buyer going to be? Typically, over the past few years, the data I've collected, you know, for a sports mother, we found that age 25 to 44 is kind of our money spot there. But for wives of people in certain careers, we're looking at 35 to 54. So our ads, you know, we might start off our ad, our initial PPE ad at 25 to 64 years old. But now I know when I launch a sports mom shirt, I'll start out at 25 to 44. Because I know that's going to be the, the, the group that's going to buy more likely than the others. This isn't always the case. But in most cases, that's how to work in the sports mothers and the job wives or whatever your, your industry is. And then once we have that initial ad, if you have a success, then you can always reach out to the other age groups as well. And that really will be determined by how successful your shirt is, um, as you'll see. Next up, we want to look at gender. You know, 
we have a lot of different type of shirts going out there. We have our most of our successes come from the female uh, angles, the female niches, wives, mothers, things like that. Now, when you target a wife shirt or you target a mom shirt, guess what else you can sell? You can sell a dad shirt or a husband shirt just like it. Same exact thing, just a different word. So these are, these are ways to reach out in the niche, reach out with the design to really maximize your sales. Think about those related angles, those related layers that you can cross promote and expand what you're selling. Now when it comes to a lot of the male uh, social media interactors, you're going to see a lot less uh, sales and conversions, especially in the shirts we do. We always seem to see that the women, even if it's the wife of the husband, will buy or the wife will buy the husband shirt more often than the husband will buy the husband shirt. Okay, and that's probably because we hit wives a lot, and that's just how that that goes. Same thing with moms and dads. A mom's more likely. Women are just more likely to buy online than men, uh, pretty much statistically. So a lot of times for our niches we know are dialed in with moms and, and the wives, we'll only target the the women to start off and then we'll expand into the males as we broaden that successful niche. Now, I only like to target males if it's a very broad niche. So like if we have a swim mom shirt, then definitely going to target women. But if we have a swimmer shirt or let's say a football shirt, then I'm going to target men and women. And we'll separate those to see which one's going to convert. A lot of the times with those double gender shirts that fit either way, then they'll both sell really well. Typically the women will always buy a little bit more, uh, but that of course depends on the design. All right, other things you want to think about are married, are they married, are they parents? These are demographics that you can select in the targeting. These are all things that you're going to really want to think about, play around with, look at your targeting, but that's about the extent of how much we, we use the demographics. We don't do like much behaviors or you know languages or, or location that's not really something we use in our advertising unless it makes complete sense in our design most of ours are just going to be the age group the gender are they married are they parents grandparents um or are they just regular joes that want to buy a football shirt or something all right so let's talk about interests All right, like I said, it's very important to figure out which interests correlate with the actual ideal buyer. <clears throat> now, when we're doing our research, we're just kind of thinking about it. You want to think about as much as possible uh, who is the ideal buyer here? Who is the ideal person that's going to want this? And what interest are they really going to be into? Which interest would you like if you're not a fan? And which one would you have no idea what it is if you're not a fan? You know what I mean? So if you're not a swimmer, but you like swimming, you might like the interest swimming, but you won't know what the hell TYR is because that is a sport, a swimming, uh, like a swimming gear product line. So those are the type of niches you're looking for. And it really takes a lot of research. Do not like slack on interest research. This is so important. And like I said, once you have the initial master list done, the huge list of interests out there, then you can just go back and tweak it later. It won't take so much time, but you'll have that master list. So for this method with our rebrandables, since we're launching so many, like I said, we're not individualizing our interest in our ads. We're not just having one to two interest per ad set like I would if I'm scaling or if I know my niche very well or if I'm pretty much promoting anything else, I separate interest. But for this, this rebrandable system where we're casting that wide net and we're trying to get rid of all as many losers as quick as possible and find as many winners as quick as possible then we like to group our interests together to kind of hit each different angle that I feel will be a success now if I launch a shirt and I have my grouped interest in that ad and that shirt does horribly then I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna look at those grouped interests that I chose I might take out a different category I might add some in there just kinda of play around with it because what it comes down to with a t-shirt success in this initial uh, net casting is design and targeting and I mean for any t-shirt you sell it's gonna come down to design and targeting but those are super super important right at first to figure out you have gotta figure it out in that niche what designs work and what targeting works after you have it the first round then you know where to go on the next shirts and that's why we're looking for that focus niche to really dive into so the first step here is once you've made your calendar you probably have 25 niches 
you're ready to launch with next week. So over the weekend, before Monday, it's time to make a master list for each one of these niches. So this is how we go about that. Just an Excel worksheet, we're going to have them listed out. And we're going to use Audience Insights and Google to really help us out. <clears throat> All right. So Audience Insights, I have a, a very extensive video on this on YouTube. Um, you can check out my blog too. If you need a link, just send me a message on Facebook later and I'll send you. Well, I'm just going to walk it through here with little screenshots. This is Audience Insights. This is where we go find our awesome uh, niche interests to kind of give us great ideas. I'm always in this place every day finding new ideas, looking for new interests, especially when we have winners or losers and stuff like that to dial it in. So the first step we want to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to type in a very broad-based interest in our niche. So in the picture here, we have the example we're dialing in on the swimmer niche. So the you know a very broad term for swimming would be freestyle swimming. This kind of gets it where we had uh, this is the shirt I think I was finding here was for um, competitive swimmers. So we're thinking something more along the lines of a broad competitive swimmer interest rather than going with just the swimming interest to start because that's very broad across the board where a lot of people like swimming but they don't necessarily like uh, swimming in competition. So we just plug this in right away. Freestyle swimming. And what Audience Insights is going to do is it's going to give you a bunch of su suggestions. Pages to like, other pages that are similar. As you can see on the bottom section, if you scroll down to Audience Insights, you're going to have this little section here where you can see affinity. Now this is going to, affinity is pretty much showing you the likeliness, uh, the relate, how much this relates to that initial interest. Uh, how much the fans relate to this initial interest. Now freestyle swimming is very broad, remember. So we're clicking the affinity, and we can see that the most affinity uh, interests are not even in our our niche. These are all like motocross and stuff like that. Um, but we can see that l lower down, more in like the 20 to 30 affinity range, we're getting things that are more dialed in to our niche. So remember I said competitive swimming. These are all Natalie Coughlin, Missy Franklin, Nathan Adrian, Dara Torres. Those are all competitive swimmers that were in the Olympics. You can see up here we even have clothing out, uh, clothing lines. That's a brand, swim outlet, products and services at TYR Sports, um, Speedo, but that's a very broad interest as well. So what we're looking here is we're looking for as many targeted interest as possible. Now I definitely suggest opening a tab for every one of these. Look at every single one of them out there. See what it's who it's talking to, who its audience is, who the the actual interest are that you want to use, um, and take every one of these that is related and in your niche and add it to this Excel worksheet. Now what you're gonna also do is you're going to go ahead and start plugging each of these back in into the additional interest area here. And every time you plug one in, you're going to have a different lineup of related likes, related pages that you can use. So we want to really pay attention to that. Every one you plug in, look at what changes. See if there's any new ones. Open a new tab so you can see what that is. And you're just going to go down the line. Every one you find, you'll have a huge list here of interests that you're going to find different related interests that you can use. Now be careful when you're doing this and you're going to be, uh, you know, if you get the broad terms like swimming, if you put swimming in here, it's going to be very broad page likes because swimming is a very broad interest. So it'll have things like running or, you know, working out. That'll be an interest that'll be pop up or something. And that's way too broad. It's not on topic, anything like that. So as you dial in and get better and better interest here, you could actually go back and eliminate the most broad. So I would take out freestyle swimming after I've got a few very targeted interests and then I'd see what pop up because that's even more targeted to the area, the angle I'm trying to go to. <clears throat> like I said, definitely make sure you keep an eye on the changes every time you plug in because you don't want to miss those good ones. Sometimes it'll only be a certain combination of interests that you have plugged in that'll give you the actual new page or the new interest that you never would have found. Uh, and you can really, honestly, you always be finding new interests when you're doing this research. 
Now, next thing you want to do is you want to head over to Google, and we're going to start doing some searches. Now, we're going to do these searches to find other possibilities to add into the audience insights here. Okay? So some things we want to plug into Google would be phrases like best niche magazines. So best swim competition magazines, best swim competition forums, best swim competition websites. You can see we just go down the line of each one of these websites, association, federation, must have gear, products, brands, clubs, rescues, books and books author. You know, these are going to give us great interest possibilities. Now, the majority of the Google search uh, results that come up will not be an interest, but they're going to get you in the right direction, and some of them will be an interest, and some of them will be really great interest that you never would have found if you didn't plug it in. So this is very important to be doing this extensive research going throughout. <clears throat> Everyone see my screen? Someone said it's not showing. Okay, good. All right, all right. All right, so we're plugging each one of these in individually back into the audience insight, insights, and it's just adding to your niche list uh, or your interest list. Now, while you're doing this, once again, look at the new variations that are popping up. Take out any that are too broad and really dial it in. Make this master list just giant. You know, we spend like three, four hours on a single niche doing this interest research sometimes just because we want a huge, giant list to start with. And then from that point on, I'll be able to pick different groups or different ones I like to kind of figure out and find the best initial PP ad to start with with our designs. Now, the next step of this to find even more interest is the alphabet test. So you want Facebook to actually give you suggestions. When you type something into the interest field, you're going to get what they think is related to that interest or whatever that term is that you're, you're typing. So you want to see what is suggested. And this a lot of times can give you great, great uh, interest. So what I do is I go through each letter of the alphabet. We start with swimmer or swimming or swimmers or swim or whatever, you're going to do all those words, and then we're going to go swimmer A, swimmer B, swimmer C, swimmer D, and then we get to the alphabet, we're going to go swimmer A, B, swimmer A, S, swimmer A, T, all the main ones, you know, for association, I would go swimmer A, S, S, O, or if we go for swimmer forums, swimmer F, O, just to kind of see if there's are any forums out there, is there any associations that are popping up, and as you can see, each time you do this, you get different results. So Swimmer A brought in a little different results. Swimmer B brought in a little different results. Swim LO brought in way different results. Swim Swimming AS brought in way other different results. So this is another way to find good related interests. And you're going to use this kind of technique a lot throughout to find those good solid interests to put into your group. Now once again, next thing we want to do, you should have a really solid list of interests by now. But the next thing we want to do is we want to go into the ad creation area, the actual ad dashboard where you can create the ad, click create an ad. You don't have to create an actual ad, but you're going to go to the interest plugin area. Now, in the last section, we are typing in swimmer, but we're not clicking enter. Swimmer A, not hitting enter, we're getting suggestions. Here, we're going to take one of these interests that we have, as you can see, swim outlet, and we're going to enter it. Now what's going to happen is you'll click into the search interest box and it's going to give you all these related interests that it's suggesting. So I go through every single interest I have on my list and I plug them in and I see what is related here. Uh, and this really gives you a lot of great suggestions that you will not find in the audience insights. It gives you a lot of crappy interests that have no reach too. But like I said, this is a master list. We want to know exactly what we're going to be able to use. Now on top of this, not even doing individual uh, interests, but then I like to take that master list and I like to categorize it. Okay, so we have general swimming terms, we got brands and products, minor celebrities, publications, you know, whatever the interest categories may be. Then I'm going to take each of those categories and plug them back into the ad creation area. And what that's going to do is it's going to have very similar interests selected in the ad so that the suggestions Facebook give you are going to be things that are similar to that. So if I was doing 
brands and products, I would type in all these and we'd see what comes up. Now, I'd probably take out Arena Swimwear because it's giant. It's a huge, broad list. So that can kind of skew your results and your suggestions. So the more targeted the interest is to that category, the better the suggestions are going to be. So as you can see, it's a very extensive research process, but this is, this is where the money's at. This is literally the $1,000 an hour work. I have tried to outsource all this. Um, with not much effectiveness. I've I had to let a few people go because of it already, just because it always comes down to where no one can really decide on what interests are going to be better than I can. And it doesn't take that much after, like I said, you get that initial master list in place. All right, so that is the initial research, the initial ad. Let me see some questions just so we can get there. All right. Is it true that interest in the lower case is what remains a precise interest? You know, honestly, Aaron, I have no idea about that. <clears throat> All right. So we have our interest list. It's time to actually create the initial PPE ad. What we're going to do is, as you can see, we have our giant list here. So what I'll go through, I'll plug each one of these into the ad creation, the PP ad that we're going to create, okay? And then I look at how many, if you just kind of uh, put your cursor over the interest that you have uh, chosen, it'll tell you how big the reach is. Now, anything over a million reach, I just eliminate. I just get it out of the way. Because I, like I said, I like to be very broad term or very targeted interest, but groups of them together to hit each of those angles. This has been a really, you know, very effective method for us. Um, once we get to stage two, we start separating interests, we start finding the groups, and the more shirts you launch, the more you're going to really dial in on that initial PPE ad. Um, like I said, if a shirt doesn't work first round with my group of interests, then I'll, I'll change it up. I'll change what we're targeting, try and get a little bit more dialed in. It might drop the reach dr dramatically, but as long as we have a really targeted group that we can hit, we can always broaden out from there. All right, so price and placement. Let's talk about that. We have the PP ad. What I like to start, $10 a day with an ad is what it used to be $25. Um, we've been playing around variations of this. <clears throat> I just started $10 a day right now. I let $10 get through. I make my first adjustments if needed. Um, we make a decision after $20 is spent. Okay, if it's a yes or no. If two sales have been made on day one after we spent $10, I'm going to bump the campaign to $20 for day two and so on. Um, if we've made one sale for the, for the first $10, then I'll just keep that at $10 for day two, see how it goes. Because like I said, we're doing a PPE ad, so we got a lot of engagement. We're getting shares, we're getting likes, comments. Those things take a few days sometimes to make sales. So that initial interaction, it might not be... Uh, or the initial sales might not be clear of how good of a winner you actually have. So some rules to kind of think about, and this is something that you're just going to have to do and get better at and understand because it changes all the time and it's really about situational things that are going on. So it's hard to put rules for this. But if you bump your budget, let's say we have day one, we made two sales, we bumped to $20, day two, uh, we make five sales, day three we bump to $40, and it crashes. Now what we do is we'll drop our, our budget back down to our last setting. So on day, day three we did $40 there, so on day four we drop it back down to $20 where we had solid ROI. Now a lot of times if you want to continue scaling at that, a lot of people suggest that you should create a duplicate ad to that initial ad, and you can have those both going at $20. So you have two ads with the exact same targeting going to the exact same campaign and the post, but they're both set at $20. So you're spending $40 in, like you originally wanted to, and a lot of times this will pick things back up again. Not all the time, uh, but a lot of times it does help out. So like I said, after $20 is, is spent, you're going to make your decision. Look how many sales are made. ROI is the most important thing. Doesn't matter click through rate, doesn't matter shares, likes. After you spend $20, $25, if you've not made a sale, just shut it off and move on. We're doing, remember, 25 designs at least a week. Really want to outreach, grow out there, whatever it can be. Um, 
So you don't want to waste too much money. This is a big thing with me. I would sometimes go like $50 on a design. And I don't think I've ever, maybe one time out of the hundreds or thousands of shirts I've launched, have I had one that did not do well in the first $20 finally pick up after the first 50 So if the first $20 you don't have something being made, then there's no reason to even worry about it. And do not get caught up on your own designs. This is such a problem with people. They think their design's awesome. I had a design freaking last week I thought was the greatest design ever. I thought I'm going to sell a thousand of these things. And we sold three. And it pissed me off so bad. And I let it go to $50, $60. And I was like, no way it's going to sell. I tried a bunch of different ad variations. And no, it didn't sell. So, And that was a niche that we do well in. So... It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what those people think. Because I'm not a swim mom, so I'll never really know what a swim mom is going to like. I can kind of see a, a pattern, but I'm not going to know what they're going to buy. And that's really what this $20 ad spend is going to tell you. Now, if things are going horribly, if you have a freaking you know, 1% click-through rating, you're getting no comments, no shares, then feel free to shut that sucker off in the first $10. Don't waste any money if you don't have to. I mean, don't get scared, but you'll start to see the numbers coming in. And like I said, ROI is your most important stat, but these other stats are going to be good indicators on what's going on. So if you spent $10 and you have good stats, then you can let it go another $10 and see how it goes. So like things like high click-through rating. This means people like your message. They like what you're doing here. They like the shirt. They like the, maybe the, the quote or the phrase on it. Or, as I've had happen a few times, they're curious what the, frick, what the hell the, the shirt says because they can't see the image. If you do too small of an image or you've got a big, long like phrase on your shirt and the, the, it's not showing up appropriately in the ad, then you're going to have a high click-through rating because people just want to see, oh, what's this say? And that, can, that costs you money. So those are things you've got to be aware of. And just because you have a high click-through rating doesn't mean you're going to have a big seller because maybe you didn't represent that message very well in a design form. So those are things you want to look at. So if you have a high click-through rating, you're not making sales, then you want to look at the actual design. The message might be great. It probably is if you have a high click-through rate. But you want to look at how you're actually representing the design and then also look at the ad. Can they see the image? If not, you know, make it bigger. All right, so we're shooting for below $0.10 cents per engagement. And really, we're these days shooting more for around like below $0.05 cents per engagement. Now, this doesn't have an indication of if you're going to sell or not. You could have a $0.30 cent engagement, and you could sell hundreds of them. Um, but in most cases, since we're doing PPE ads, we want lots of engagement, so we want that cost low because a lot of our sales are going to come through shares, comments, all that engagement interaction we've been talking about. And like I said, the other stat we look at is comments and shares. What are they saying? What are they doing? Are they tagging people they like? Are they saying, I love this? Are they saying, oh my God, you need to buy this for me, Dave? You know, what are, what's going on? Within the first $10, $20, you should have a few comments. You should have a few hundred likes, you know, 100 likes, 50 shares, and six comments would be a solid first $10 or $20 in. And those aren't exacts. But you should have some interaction going in the first $10, $20. And by the first $20, you'll have pretty much, you'll know where your engagement's at. Um, first 5 to $10, your engagement may be really high. You may be at like 30 $0.25 cents per engagement, but that can, that can drift down um, easily to the $0.05 cent range. I've seen that a million times. Um, and that's just because Facebook is optimizing your ads at all time, and we take advantage of that fact a lot through this program, as you're going to see. So we have to give it that first 10 to $20 ad spend to really focus it in, allow Facebook to dial it in and get that engagement we want. So let's look at an example of a campaign budgeting. That's just one example. Like I said, so many variations can go on. It really just takes living in it and doing it and seeing what you like best. This is what I do today. I'll be honest, I change this probably 50 times over the past six months. And it's just kind of, I guess not 50 times, but you get the point. We're changing all the time. Facebook ads are always changing. We want to always be optimizing, always increasing our margins. So right now, I like a slower drip feed where I started at $25 in the initial day. We really got a good idea if that sucker was going to sell quickly, but it scaled a little too quick. Uh, when we try to double our, our budget every day, it really dropped ROI quicker than we wanted to and more drastically. 
And then I went to a $5 a day uh, start. And we would go $5 and we'd, we'd wait till it spent $20. But that freaking took forever. It was like two weeks before you kind of even knew if a share was going to sell or not when we were knowing within 24 hours uh, on our last method. So now I'm in between. Because if you go the slow route, the $5 a day method, some people love to do this. Um, and they love that long-term drip sales coming in. That's what that $5 a day budget does. Um, and it's a, it's a three-month long campaign you're trying to figure out instead of just a, a 10 to 14 day. In this case, we're trying to see what happens as much as possible in the first week or two. So this is an example of budgeting. We have day one, $10 start. Um, things have gone well. Let's say we sold two shirts. Day two, we're going to bump that up to $20. Now when I say bump it up, we only adjust our budget once a day. No more than that because it'll screw up Facebook's algorithm. And that's, like I said, we want Facebook to optimize for us. Let them help you. That's what their whole system's for. Um, so I like to do it in the morning too. So about 8 o'clock in the morning, I will change my budget if I'm going to bump it up, lower it, whatever it may be. And then if it's, we'll just let it go the day and see how it goes. <clears throat> All right, so let's say day two, we made 10 sales. Day three, we're going to bump up to $40. Sweet. Working out, we make 10 sales that day too. Okay, now remember, every time you're bumping budget up, you're going to be losing ROI. So in the first two days, you might, you might have a shirt that's doing like 1,000% ROI. But when you start getting up to $50, $100 budgets, then it might drop down to 300%, 200%, 100%. But you're making money. Remember, positive ROI is what we want. Um, don't destroy all your positive ROI with your ad campaign by letting it run too long. But if you're... If you look at the total amount of money made in a campaign rather than the percentage of ROI, you're going to be better off. Okay, because if I'm spending a thousand dollars a day and I'm making five or a thousand dollars back from that with a hundred percent ROI, I'm completely fine with that, and I'd much rather have that than be spending ten dollars a day and be making a hundred dollars from it, and and just because of the mass amount of money I can go. And the more money you get in quicker, the more shirts you can launch, the more you can grow your system, the more you're going to be able to put in play everything I'm going to show you in stage two, stage three. So let's say day four, we had bumped up to $80 per day. ROI crashes drastically. We were at 150% ROI day four. We're at 75% on day five, or day, yeah, after day four. So what we're going to do, like I said, we drop that budget back down to $40, and we're going to let that go for the day. Let's say that ROI steadies out again, back it gets back to 100, 115%, or 125, whatever. Um, now, day six, we still want to scale. We still want to make this go up. We don't want to let it sit. Um, so what I do is... Well, like I said, they'll create a duplicate ad. In my case, I like to look at the reporting. I like to look at the data we've uh, established over the first five, six days, and I create a second ad that has that ideal demographics a little bit more dialed in. So if our, <clears throat> our initial ad is 25 to 64 years old, females and males, but it's still producing a quality ROI, just not where I want, I want to duplicate it, and I'll create the ideal buyer group of let's say females 25 to 44 and I'll let both of those run. I won't turn off the initial. I used to always turn off the initial. I don't anymore because it's just kind of the scaling effect. I want more overall profit per campaign rather than percentage of ROI. I'm not too worried about hitting my 1700% ROIs anymore like I was, which is always great, but if I rather if I make 10,000 more dollars but 100% ROI in the campaign, who gives a crap? And then from there, it's just the same process. You're doubling, dropping, doubling, dropping. And that's how we go about our first round here. This is only for the first 10 to 14 days. This is not how we go about the entire three-month process. But this is our first campaign to get as much statistical data as possible. We really, this first campaign is about the data. We want to see if the shirt sells. We want to see what our interests are doing. We want to see what the demographics are. Who's the, who's, what gender, what age, what type of person? Are they married, parents? Those are things you want to dial in on this first round. Now, I start with mobile and desktop together. We've done a lot of different variations of this as well. Um, a lot of the time, mobile only is better. Mobile seems to about 80% of the time produce a much better ROI and much more sales. And that's because we're using, think about it, a PPE ad. And what do people do on mobile? It's all about engagement. You get like four or five times as much engagement on a mobile ad than you will a desktop. So those are naturally typically going to produce more sales. Now that's not always the case. And that's why we always start with mobile and desktop uh, 
together. And then what we can do in the reporting is actually you can see without having to separate all these different things, you can see in the reporting which age groups are buying, which the device they're buying from, which gender is buying, whereas something like interest, we have to separate those individually in ad sets and test them individually to see what's going to work. <clears throat> all right, just what I said there. So yeah, this first round, our goal is to find the, the placement, the gender, the age, all that good stuff. Cecil's asking, you ever do $100,000, $500,000? You know, I usually don't. I kind of max out at about $50 um, per day on a single ad, a single ad set. I don't like to go above $50 on an ad set. Um, I've gone to $100, $250, $500 a day on a single ad set, and it's never really worked out for me. Um, but I haven't done it in a, a, a a while, probably six months. So my system's a little different now. Um, I like to rather, I'd rather create a new ad set and be able to control it. It just seems like smaller budgeted ads seem to work a little bit better um, as far as Facebook. Because if you bump your budget too high, $500 to $1,000 a day, Facebook just throw in traffic out there. Okay, it's not going to really give it the opportunity to optimize it and show it to the ideal people. It's just going to show it to the half million people of the million reach you have. Um, and we want to avoid that as much as possible. And we're thinking about our shirts in the long run, remember. This is only the initial test to the, the whole thing, uh, seeing what's going to work. Are we going to take this to stage two? Are we going to trash it? Is it going to be put on our, on our e-commerce store, but we're not going to advertise it? You know, Those are questions we're going to be asking ourselves in this round one. So, some promotion strategies that I use in my first round of the campaign. Free shipping, first 20 orders. Uh, this is a great one to help just kind of conversions, kind of help it kick off, help lose or uh, help you lose less money on losing campaigns. Because like I said, 80% of your campaigns are going to fail in this, this wide net uh, approach. So, if we have just that extra 1% conversion happening, we might break even instead of lose $50 in our first, uh, first run. So, for free shipping, first 20 orders works really well. Um, I think I showed you that in the copy section up here. We had it in the copy. Uh, you'll see it later. But it just says on the top of the sales page, uh, free shipping, first 20 orders. With Teespring, you can create promotion codes. Um, that will have a little green thing pop up says hey you got your five dollars off or whatever um, now we do retargeting ads after day two we don't do very extensive retargeting on this first round of campaigns like I said I'm really worried about more worried about the demographics and the data um, when we get to stage two here or stage two as you're gonna see we go heavy duty retargeting we do heavy duty outreach and that stuff now another campaign promotion we do last day promotion so if it's a 14-day campaign, on day 14, we'll have a, an ad be placed out that says, hey, here, get $5 off on the last day, or, or don't forget to grab this, you only got five hours left. And these are ads that are rolling out there on that last day. Now, is it the last day they can buy that shirt? No. It's the last day they can buy on that campaign. So if they want it printed tomorrow and sent to them ASAP, they better buy. If they buy to the next day, then they're going to have to wait till the campaign ends, especially when we're using this Teespring uh, gear bubble type of setup. So that is stage one of the process. All right, I'm going to go through the questions here and see what we got, try and uh, answer some things. If you got anything popping up, let me know. We will go over lookalike audiences. Designs, Merrick, very big thing. Just got to be out there looking at all times. Minimum budget you can spend on campaigns. I suggest having at least $500 available to do this, not for a single campaign, but just to you know be able to play around because a lot of times you're going to lose money before you make money. Talk about that. Right audiences, talked about that. Yes. Yep, being recorded. All right, so initially when I create a campaign, the length is about 10 to 14 days. 
I go through this process for all 25 shirts. Now, like I said, you're going to have 23 of them, 22 of them are going to be shut off in the first two days. Okay? You're going to have three that might make it to the next week. Then we have 25 more going out in 25 niches, but we have those three that are running for the 14 days. So it kind of adds up as you go, go down the line. After a week, a month, whatever, you're going to have a lot going. All right, for the last day campaign, do you use conversion ads or website clicks? Do I place the budget low or high? All right, so I do, what do we got here? We do website conversion ads. I don't use website, click to website ads very much anymore. I used to a lot. I actually started that method. Uh, when I first started, it was only click the websites. We went website conversions on our retargeting ads, PP ads on everything else. Only time I use website conversions will be uh, if I have a retargeting ad, if I have a interest that's taking off and doing well when I separate them, then I'll duplicate that and make it a website conversion ad too because that allows Facebook to dial in that, that good interest I know is good and, and dials it into the conversion. All right, so let's go into stage two. I shouldn't be answering questions now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> We've got two stages to go. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything. All right. Close. All right, stage two. You saw stage one. What happened in stage one? Casting a wide net, looking for winners, throwing 25 designs out there. By the end of your first week, hopefully you've got two or three that are at least breaking even or making 100% ROI. We want to be making money, and I like to at least be making double what I'm spending to really scale with it. Now in stage two, this is when we're finding how high we can take this shirt or how high we can take this niche. Like I said, when it comes to a rebrandable design, you're probably not going to sell thousands of them. Um, you can sell hundreds. I sold, I broke a thousand a few times on a few of my rebrand designs, but most of the time you'll sell thousands by hitting 100 niches with it. So it's a little different scaling process where you're really just kind of following stage one process of doubling. But once you have a winner that really takes off, and you'll know this right away, when you launch a shirt that's just selling like crazy, it'll sell like crazy right away, and it'll sell like crazy for the first whole campaign. This is when you know, let's go stage two and really take it to new heights. Now, if you're not selling crazy, you're still taking it to stage two, but more of the idea is to dial in your demographics. Let's test what's working. Let's test our interests. Let's test our demographics. Find our ideal buyer group for this niche, for this design, because you're going to use that information to sell this shirt long term after stage two, plus you're going to use that information to find the next designs to sell in this niche. This is where it starts adding up. Once you start getting them rolling, like I said, we have 13 niches right now we're hitting, and we have you know two, three, four shirts going to each of those from months ago, and then we have new launches coming on those each two, every two, three weeks. So it starts to really add up as you things get, get going. So let's talk about scaling a winning shirt. When you have a shirt that just absolutely starts selling like crazy, what you want to do is after stage one, it went 14 days, you're going to relaunch that sucker and you're going to start scaling. Let's say you ended the campaign at $50 a day budget um, and you sold 150 shirts or something like that. Good job. Now we relaunch it and we're gonna go into the scaling and testing process. Now, never be afraid to relaunch a campaign. That's something I should mention. I did that, uh, I had that fear for a while there. I literally, for all of 2014, I would sell a shirt, we'd go for 14 days, we'd relaunch it once, it'd be a month long campaign total, and I would not sell that shirt again with advertising uh, ever. And we hit a ceiling. At December there, we hit a ceiling. January here definitely felt it of 50,000, 60,000 a month because we were always looking for new designs. And you really, that's kind of the whole point of building these assets is so you don't have to always be looking for new customers and new designs and new products and all that. You have a base of products that you know sell. If you've made it to st the stage two, you know it sells. It's a, it's a winner. So let's look at a 
design that just kind of blew it out of the water. Now, this is not my design. This is uh, Thomas Bartke's design, actually. Uh, he's in a little private mastermind group with, uh, with me, and we kind of share our, all our T-shirt secrets and stuff together. Um, but this was the Pi Day shirt. This is a shirt on the left here. I think he sold like 10,000 freaking copies of this on this Pi Day thing. And you can even see this is what someone posted on his fan page. He was selling it. They got a tattoo of his freaking design. So this is pa that's passion. This is when you're going to scale. This is the type of design. It took off right away. He knew it was going to be a big winner. So this is the type that you can really roll with and kill it with. And these are your big money. These aren't going to come around often. You know, we do the rebrandable system to have that consistent money to find our consistent winners to bring into stage two, to dial in, and we bring them to stage three to sell a couple every day for the long term. These right here are something uh, that sells, you know, $30,000 in a week or two weeks. Those are not likely to happen, but when they do, it's most it's just extra money kind of on top of our consistent system. We are always looking for these, and once you dial in on your niche, once you have a shirt, two shirts, three shirts dialed in, you're going to start doing more unique designs, as I'm going to talk about here in the scaling the niche. You're not just going those rebrandables that you know are going to sell 50 to 100, but you're looking for something that's only going to connect with that audience, only connect with those swim moms and not the wrestler moms and not the band moms or whatever it may be. So the Pi Day is an example of this. We don't, we can't rebrand that in anything. So pretty much in, in stage two here, our goal is to find the ideal buyer for this shirt. We know it sells. We've made some money, probably doubled our revenue, our, our profit at least. Um, now it's to find out who is buying this, how many people will buy this out there, what interests are going to be my ideal interests for this niche. All those different questions need to be asked. So to do this, we always need to be examining our data. Facebook reports is your friend. Now Facebook reports in the ad dashboard, you just click the link on the left. It'll say reports. It'll bring you to the stats. As you can see, here's a little example campaign we ran over the past uh, first round, the first 14 days. And these are the stats I like to set up in my reports. We have reach, frequency, clicks, click-through rating, amount spent, amount checkouts, conversion rate checkouts, cost per checkout, the amount of shares, amount of comments, website clicks, and page likes. Pretty much that's all I need to know. All that other data that you can choose, I don't really need for my t-shirt stuff. I'm sure there's some good information out there I'm missing, but this gives me as much as I need. I even put them in kind of uh, importance, level of importance. So checkouts, most important. That's ROI. Cost per checkout, we can see what we're making. You know, um, If I'm making $20 a hoodie and we're selling hoodies and I'm doubling my ROI on this one, we know is awesome where it's doubling that one, we're quadrupling that one, so what are we going to do with that ad? I'm going to freaking bump that sucker up, figure out what's winning there. This one's breaking even. So if we got buyer leads coming in, cool, no problem, I'll let that run, because we got that buyer leads we can sell other stuff to. This one made nothing, so screw that, that's turned off. This one lost us $20, turn it off. You know, this is kind of the data we're trying to figure out here. Now, if we don't have much conversion data yet, like in the first $10, $20, you're not really going to be able to make huge decisions on ROI specifically in different demographics. But what we can look at is shares. Like I said, very important engagement. Comments. These two things are your most important things to really look at. And of course, website clicks. If a ad is not getting people to the actual shirt sales page and it's getting a lot of uh, engagement, who cares? That's not going to make you sales. You have to have people going to the actual website and buying your product. So, that is how we set up our reports. We look at this every day. I go in here every day, every two days for each campaign. I'll just make a quick note. I have a little save uh, setting to where we have this breakdown saved, and I just have to add the filter keyword to be able to find the right campaign. Stats pop right up. And we look at these and make adjustments. Now, like I said, we don't have to even separate age into different ad sets. We don't have to separate gender. We don't have to separate placement even to find out which one is selling, which one's doing better. We can actually have Facebook break that down for us. So in the breakdown area with these same stats, we could choose age and gender, and each of these we've broken up into each age and gender. So there'd be eight different uh, 
variations of each ad set with the stats. And then we can see which age group's buying. Oh, the 25 to 44s are buying. So you turn off the 45 to 65 or 64s. You know, it's as simple as that. Same thing, placement of device. Which one's selling? Mobile? All right, cool. We're going to turn on mobile and turn off desktop. You can even break it down into what type of device. So you can see iPhones, galaxies, what type of uh, what type of phone they have, and dial it in even more on that level. Now, we don't go that far uh, too often with our t-shirts, but when we're selling cell phone covers to these t-shirt buyers, hell yes, we do dial it down because we'll have an iPhone cover that might not have a Galaxy X version or whatever. So we only target iPhone buyers or iPhone users. And yes, you can target your Facebook ads to only people with certain devices. So we always want to be checking our data. Always check our age, gender, placement, and stuff like that so we can see our ideal demographics. Now the next thing we need to do is we need to test our interest. So, oh, excuse me, ad separation. Let's, let's go into the, this age and gender. When you have a winner, let's say you have the 25 to 44s selling very well, um, and you've hit, like I said, I only go kind of max $50 budget per day. So if that 25 to 44 ad is at $50, I'm not going to bump it to 100 the next day. What I'll do is I'll, create, I'll separate those age groups. So I'll have one ad set going at 25 to 34 and one ad set at 35 to 44 at both the $50. So that will have it where you can scale. And this is really, when you have a shirt that's really selling well, this is how you'll separate it. And you can do the same thing with genders, male, female, um, whatnot. And then interest. This is all, if you have a, a shirt really taking off, you can separate by interest, start testing those out. These are all PPE ads, remember. I'm only using website conversion for retargeting. Um, Retargeting ads, I think only retargeting ads, what did I say else? And lookalikes, yeah, lookalikes and retargeting, uh, we're doing that. Now we're separating interest and we're going to see which one's converting. Now if we have an interest that does very well, we'll double that interest with a website conversion ad. So you have one PP ad targeting that one interest and you have one website conversion ad targeting an interest. And like I said, that website conversion ad will dial in the demographics for that single interest. Because if you think about it, Every single interest has its own demographics. It might be the same across the board in a niche just because it's a niche, but every interest is different. So it might be a little different. There might be a little variation in who converts on that interest and who really is that ideal demographic. So that's why we like to separate these ads into each of those categories so that we can see what's really working out there. And that's just kind of basic scaling. Uh, uh, of jumping up a campaign that's just flying off the handle. Now we also want to be testing those. If we have a campaign that's only selling, you know, a hundred per launch, um, we're still doing the separation. We may not leave on our interest ads as long because they might be losing money, and we start turning off all the ones that aren't working, and we only have five or six interest ads actually going alongside our original. But that's that's just the process. This whole stage two is very hard to give you real life data that's going to be applied in your campaigns because it's different every single time and you really just got to get out there start separating the ads and figuring out which demographic is going to work for you test tweak test tweak test tweak that's really it so with each of these ads i should also mention we're starting at five dollars a day that's our initial ad that starts these anything after the initial PPE ad, where we started at $10 a day and we start bumping up. Anything that we separate, we start at $5 a day. Any website conversion ad, $5 a day. If it's converting, same process as before. If we made two sales in the first day, bump it to 10. Made four sales in the second day, bump it to 20. Same exact thing across the board. It's just a scaling process. Now you're not, like I said, these campaigns that you're going to be doing that for all your different ages and all your genders and all your interests, really is not going to come around very often. Those are the ones where you're selling thousands of shirts in a two-week, three-week period. Um, and we don't, we, those don't come often, so you won't really have so many interests going. You'll be shutting off a lot, dialing it in, and finding those super dialed-in demographics that we can use in Stage 3. Just keep that in mind. Stage 2 is about finding the winners. Find the winner, that you, the winning demographics, the winning targeting, everything you're going to need to really take it to the next level. 
All right, so what we're doing here with the scaling too, we separate all our ads. We are doing age, gender, interest separation. We have website conversion ads going out for those that are really doing well. Next off, this is when we start heavy duty retargeting. And heavy duty retargeting is gonna go throughout the campaign from this point on. Now, retargeting ads are killer and they're absolutely essential for long-term success. Um, you know, it's statistic. They think uh, like a statistic out there says that an average buyer has to see a, the offer seven to ten times before they buy. You know, so if you're just sending them to the the page once, that's not that seven to ten times. You need retargeting ads to keep getting them back, keep showing that ad, keep showing that shirt design to them. Other options they may have, different different things to entice them to come into your page. So, you know. At one time, and a few times, with some of my products and funnels I have out there, the entire goal is to get people to the retargeting ad. We don't even care about the front-end sales. We, we, we can lose money on the front-end ad as long as we know that they got to that page and we can retarget them with the right sequence and the right promotions. You're going to definitely get them back in the door. Um, and like I said... These retargeting ads, the retargeting audiences you're creating, they're much like an email list. You can continue to contact them. You don't have to just sell this shirt. For example, um, one thing I'm so excited about Don Wilson's gear bubble with the cell phone covers, going to make that very easy for us to produce where we've been drop shipping cell phone covers up to this point. Um, what we do, you have a shirt that sells. You sell 300 uh, coal miner shirts that does really well. You take that exact same design, you throw it on a cell phone cover, and then you retarget that initial buyer list or that buyer group and say, hey, you can get this cell phone cover for $5 off too. You won't believe how well that does. And there's so many products out there, mugs, hats, all that stuff you can do with retargeting on it. So retargeting is where it's at. Uh, now, to create a retargeting, you're going to have to create a custom audience. You go into the audiences section and the ad dashboard, little link on the left. You'll see the create audience on the top right. They'll have custom audiences, uh, look like audiences, and uh, I can't remember the third one. But anyways, when we're doing our custom audience for our retargeting, what we like to do is we want to make sure that we're creating a custom audience of people that are visiting our sales page but have not visited our thank you page. Okay, so what that does is it, it, it creates a custom audience of people who have gone to the sales page and not purchased. If they've purchased, then they've been to the thank you page, and that excludes them. We already know they bought, so we don't want to promote the same product to them um, over and over. We're just wasting money on that case. And a lot of times people say they like the comments from people saying, oh, I bought this, I can't wait to get mine, stuff like that. Yeah, Social Proof does well, but remember this is retargeting. They've already seen the Social Proof pretty much from the initial PP ad. The fact that they're seeing the, the shirt over and over again is Social Proof. It's out there. You know, it's, it's in the back of their mind. Oh, that shirt's professional. I've seen it 20 times over the week. You know, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, you can also create custom audiences of those who only purchase the product, like I said, that we do, and we sell cell phones, uh, covers, mugs, whatever you can do. You can sell different styles of the shirt. Um, you know, if someone buys a t-shirt, you wouldn't believe how many times they'll buy a hoodie too or a tank top or a long sleeve or, you know, have a girlfriend that wants it or whatever. So it's very important to have retargeting audiences and all these and really dive into how you can have different variations. Start playing with them. Um, retargeting ads are always website conversion ads. Like I said, $5 a day start. Bump up as necessary. These do awesome. I'm just telling you, this is freaking gold. Um, we usually hit like under five dollars a conversion when it comes to retargeting. That, that is our goal. Sometimes you're seeing one to two dollar conversions. All right, all right. So the key to finding inversions works. When we talk about heavy duty retargeting, when I first did this, I would just set up a custom audience and I would create one retargeting ad. They would have the same shirt on there and a very similar message. That's not the way you do retargeting. You freaking you test everything when you do retargeting, and you can quickly turn them off. If it's not converting, you're not getting that five dollars per sale conversion. Turn off the retargeting ad. And just go with the ones that work. The five dollars a day really allows you to kind of test different variations without spending too much money. So different variations we're trying. Test headlines. We could go something like, "I if you didn't get this, you need it now," or "Don't miss this," or "Are you a, a veteran wife that loves hoodies?" You know. Test copy, the little words that are in here, have different variations to every ad set. 
Um, in each ad set, you can have multiple ads, and Facebook will optimize the traffic who sees those ads. So if you have four ads set up in a single ad set, each of them have four different headlines, Facebook will see which one's getting the best engagement for the ad and or conversions, whatever you have it set up to optimize, and they'll only show traffic that one that converts the best. Okay, So that's something you really want to take advantage of with these retargeting ads because that will allow that $5 budget to not be wasted on ones that don't work. It's actually $5 across that four ads, and maybe three of those ads only get $0.50 cents a piece, but the one that's getting the most engagement, the most conversions, whatever it may be, that's getting the, the full 350. Now we want to be testing one variable at a time. So in one ad set, you'd be testing headlines. In one ad set, you'd be testing copy, one ad, or one ad set images, um, one thing at a time. Now on top of the typical headlines, copy, images, we want to see different things like shirt color. Um, we start out usually with a standard black color, but you can go into your analytics and you can check out what's the second most purchased product. So a lot of times in this shirt right here, which we've been selling forever. Why did I do that? Um, what was I saying? Oh, the second most selling uh, version of this is the navy blue one. So we have this variation of the retargeting ad that says, hey, have you seen these yet? There's some other colors. You might like these. And it does pretty well. And on top of that, try different styles. T-shirt style. If we're selling the hoodie at the beginning, check out the T-shirt style of it. Um, tank top style, whatever it may be. That's that's how you go about that. All right, you can also test out promotion offers. Like I said, free shipping, money off. You know, uh, I know you saw this and you didn't grab it, but now you can grab it for five dollars off. You know, that's a great month discount offer promotion, and you just have to use your discount code that you have set up or your Teespring promotion code. So when they click the link, it has that automatically done. Um, free shipping usually does very well. We like to throw those discount promotions and stuff in the last day campaigns and a lot of times with our retargeting. And a lot of times you won't even need that with a retargeting. It's more about thinking the sequences of it. So we have all these going and typically they'll all be converting. The different color one will convert, the different style one will convert, the promotion one will convert, and it's a sequence of ads that these people are seeing. Remember, seven to ten views, seven to ten views before purchase. So they saw the initial PP ad. They loved the black version, um, but they didn't. They they were looking for some a blue version, but they couldn't figure out Teespring and how to change the color. So they see this ad. Now they see, oh, there is a blue version. So they might buy there. If they don't buy there because they don't like hoodies, they might see the t-shirt the version and buy there. Different variations of your audience will buy different things and typically you'll have like 10 freaking retargeting ads that are converting at $3 a conversion and that's when you're really, really having great ROI on these long-term campaigns. Alright, so that is retargeting. Let's look at lookalike audiences. All right, so lookalike audiences can come in two variations. You can have a lookalike audience. Well, you can have a lot of different variations, actually. You can have a lookalike audience that is a lookalike of a custom audience you built, so that retargeting audience that you built, that custom audience that you have people that have visited your sales page and not bought your product, that is an audience that you can create a lookalike around. Now lookalikes are Facebook will go out and find other viewers on Facebook who are similar in a lot of different ways to that initial group. Okay. Now this always doesn't target it down really great, but it gives you a starting base of more people to reach. This is really good when you have a shirt campaign that's been selling for a month or two months and you need to reach out and you've run out of interest to try. So you go and you create lookalike audiences that you can spread out into different related topics um, and, and broader interests that, that weren't working for you before. So we create lookalikes not only from our our custom audience are retargeting. We also create some lookalike audiences from the page we're actually selling on. Um, so if it has a few thousand fans, you can create a lookalike audience of that fan page. And those are different audience groups that you can target. Now, the real money maker when you're scaling, and even if you have a shirt that's only drip selling and not selling a lot, 
create custom lookalike audiences around the conversion pixel. Conversion pixels are very important to put in place. Once you've made 100 conversion pixels fire off, you can create a lookalike audience to that buyer group. So it's going to find people that are related to the buyers of what you're doing. Now, like I said, this initial lookalike audience still won't be super targeted and high converting. Okay, so what we do is we combine this lookalike audience with broader interests that are out there, things in your niche. So if we look at this one, this is for that veteran shirt I was showing you. Um, we have these different single interests, Wounded Warrior Project, United States Marine Corps, United States Navy. These are interests I would never, ever target in the initial ad, the initial campaign. But when you combine them with a lookalike audience from the conversion pixel, we're getting really great conversions. I mean, we make $20 a sale here. And I mean, we've got really, this was just a few days ago. Um, we've got like, I think like 40 or 50 of these going right now. And they're all in a positive ROI. And they're making sales every day. So that's how you can, and that shirt's been running two months. And it's, it's, it's just starting to blow up now because I've gotten all the demographic, the data that's going out there. And I picked up this little lookalike trick not too long ago. So I'm very happy about that. This is... This opens up a whole new ball game, guys. Like it really does change the game when you get it. When you get that, the whole goal is to get the hundred pixels, hundred conversion pixels. Make a hundred sales that fire off on the conversion pixel, and you're golden from there. Now, when you're creating your lookalike audiences, you can go from broad uh, audiences at ten percent lookalike down to one percent. Um, you'll see when you create them, it's a little dragging bar. Um, I go right at the lower end, about three to four percent. The lower percentage means the more the less reach it'll have in that look like audience, but the more dialed into the initial demographics and, and the person that bought or whatever. So around three or four percent seems to be my money spot right now. Um, don't take me up on that in six months. That might change because I'm playing around with this quite a bit. Now, like I said, more broad interest are finding a target here. Don't feel bad if you're going for tiny interest as well. Some of these are gonna have will have like an, a reach of a million. And that's fine. Five dollars a day. We bump up ten if it's working. Stuff like that. This also opens up uh, related interests. So let's say you have a swim mom shirt or a swimmer shirt that's doing really well, but you in the initial ad you're not going to be targeting things like triathlons and dicathlons or something that's a little bit off niche, a little bit out there compared to who you want to be targeting for the initial ad, but with the lookalikes audience comparison, you can double these up and really kill it. So that allows you to just expand your reach. That's the great thing about lookalikes is it opens up millions of new people that would be interested in buying your shirt that you would have never even thought of in the first place. Lookalike audiences are WC ads, conversions, as you can see, website conversions. Is what we're doing here is we want Facebook to op optimize for the conversion and not for the engagement. We're already past the engagement point. We have the PP ads going. We have the ad, the PP ads separated into age, gender, interest if necessary. And then now we're looking for the conversion data. This is what we're really targeting in. And then this type of data uh, that you get from the conversion ads is what you're going to be able to use in your next campaigns uh, on the PP ad side. You can dial it in even more, and you know you're going to get conversions because you have it dialed in on all fronts, age, gender, interest, you know, device placement, all that good stuff. <coughs> now, like I said, when we had the initial campaign, we have it set up to where you have tees, hoodies, and long sleeves. Now, if a shirt's really taking off and selling well, then we'll set up a new Teespring listing or a campaign that will have tanks and kids version or whatever the other options are because like I said sometimes people want other variations and if something's selling really well you could have like let's say the pie design for example it sold probably 6,000 t-shirts 3,000 hoodies 500 tank tops you know 400 long sleeves and he had separate campaigns set up for the tank tops and the hoodies and the, the long sleeves and these are just another way to scale out there whereas if you have them all in one campaign it might not convert as well there's too many options you never want to give your buyer too many options on a sales page it's just kind of the more things in their way the less likely they are to purchase all right, so that is scaling a winning shirt that is testing and tweaking a winning shirt something that's gone from uh, 
stage one and you're taking a stage two, find the demographics. If it's selling like crazy, then ramp up whatever you're doing as much as you possibly can. Create as many retargeting ads, as many lookalike audiences, as many ad separation uh, ads as possible. And that's how you sell thousands when you have a shirt that wins. Now this, like I said, will not be happening most of the time. So this process of scaling and winning a shirt really is going to be about dialing in your demographics, dialing in your interest, using those lookalike aud audiences, getting to that 100 mark on the conversion pixels so that you can use the lookalike audiences, and really playing around with how are you going to advertise this for the next six months? What, what areas are going to be open uh, to really expand on? Now... If this is your first shirt that's had success in a niche, or your first shirt at all even, you're in stage two, you've had a shirt succeed, you can sell this for the long term, a few sales a day. Now, like I said, what you want to do is you want to focus in on that niche. You want to have a few other designs um, popping up as soon as possible. Now, when you hit like two or three designs, um, especially if you're doing the rebrandable designs method to start, if you hit two or three rebrandable designs that hit off well for you in a single niche, you're going to have a lot of data to go by. You're going to know who those people are who are going to buy. <coughs> you know what messages they like, all that good stuff. So this is when you want to start looking at expanding in that niche. We want to find unique designs that are one of a kind that can sell tons of to this niche that really connect with that passion and not just a message that connects with a certain angle. So like I said, the goal here, if you're just starting or just jumping into a niche, is find two or three designs that get to stage two in a single niche. Once you're there, you can dial into the main, the very targeted, focused designs that will work in that niche for you. Now, I always used to just do the rebrandal design method, and like I said, it would kind of uh, die out on us. We had like a ceiling we'd hit, but then when we focused in on our niches, we started doing those uniques as long uh, uh, as well as our long-term relaunch plan. Uh, it just kind of blew up from there and wasn't stopping. <coughs> so we want to focus on these niches that are doing well, and you can continue to do stage one at all times. Every week you're doing stage one, finding new rebrandable designs, finding new niches that are going to go to stage two and make it to stage three. But you want to focus in on a single niche as soon as possible. That's your main focus because, like I said, you'll get these niches that every shirt you launch will, will make you money. They'll break even at least, and then they'll have winners that really take off often. Because, like I said, the more you connect with the audience, the better you're going to sell. The more shirts you sold in a single niche, the more you're going to know what connects with them. It's just you know common sense. So, let's say you have the first shirt winning. Stage two went through. You've got a second shirt coming through. Don't be afraid to have the first shirt still selling. We like, like I said, I used to stop shirts after a month and not keep them rolling. But that kept a ceiling on us. So now what we got is we got three shirts going at once. Maybe only two of them have $25 a day budgeted to them. They're making five sales a day or whatever. And we have the one new design that's really taking off. It's our latest one, our newest one. And we're spending $500 a day on that one. That's selling hundreds. And that just kind of adds up as you get more and more focus in that niche. Like I said, we're looking for unique designs for the niche. Something that's going to be one of a kind for that person. Really make that passionate person connect with whatever you got. So here are a few examples of one-of-a-kind designs. I work with strippers for electricians. This is something that we wouldn't be able to do in other niches. That phrase, I mean, we could put I work with something, but that it, it won't have any effect because strippers are both, well, strippers who dance on a pole and strippers who are, are uh, pliers that strip the wire. So... This is an example of a unique design. Another unique design, fish naked, show off your rod. It's that, that play on words. This is what's fun when you get to unique designs in a single niche is you start looking at play on words. You can't do a play on words across multiple niches in rebrandable design. You can do lots of play on words in every niche out there. Every niche has certain phrases that no one's going to really understand or connect with. Everyone's going to have different things that only they know in the niche. Those are the things you're looking for in these unique designs. Now, like I said, we have this niche focused in. We're doing the unique designs. We have our old designs still running. Now, we use these focused niches to find our good rebrandable designs as well. So if we have 
if we don't have a unique design for next week in the fishing niche, but we have a re or we don't have a unique design in the fishing niche plan for next week, but we have a rebrandable design idea we want to do well in, and we're focused in on the fish niche, then we will do that rebrandable design around the fishing because we have it dialed in. We'll see if it's a winner, and we can expand into all those other niches that we don't know the demographics, we don't know the targeting. But if the design is good enough, you're gonna sell. That's kind of the cool thing. If you have an amazing design and poor targeting, you'll still sell shirts. You might not sell a lot or many, but you'll still sell shirts with a good design that has bad targeting. If you have bad design and great targeting, you won't sell a single shirt. So think about that always. Design is everything when it comes to a niche. So that's what we're looking for in those rebrandables. And we can use these focused in, dialed in niches in stage two to find the good ones. And this is how we're continually reaching new niches. Every week we're doing it, trying to expand our empire, um, branching out into whatever it may be. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into stage three. Stage one, we had the rebrand design system going. We're finding our new niches. We're finding our good designs. We're finding all that information. Stage two, we're either taking it to as high as we possibly can, as quick as we possibly can, or we're just trying to sell as many as, as many as we can in the period and find those ideal demographics for the long-term setup and the next rebrand design test we're going to throw out there. So stage three is our long-term status. This is where you're going to start putting in long-term processes into play for that niche. We have two, three designs that are working, or you just have your first designs done very well in stage two, or it's even just selling five a day at a positive ROI. It doesn't matter. You're going to stage three with it. We want to focus in on a, a niche as soon as possible so that we can start building our stage three assets. And those assets come down to social media, email list, and your e-commerce store. E-commerce is going to be your brand. We want to create our own brand. That's the thing that Teespring, Gearbubble, all these platforms don't really offer us is that we cannot create our own brand. We're building their brand more so than ours. So it's important to have your own brand building system in place because that's really where big money's made in branding, not in products. Okay, so keep that in mind. You'll make big money by creating a, a powerful brand, not a powerful product. So first thing we want to do when we have a successful niche that we know we're going to focus on, we have a shirt, we have two shirts maybe, whatever it may be, we're, we're going to start creating social media. And this is going to come down to fan pages. Um, since we're running ads, we have traffic coming to not only our t-shirts, but we're doing PP ads, remember. So they're sending traffic to our fan pages. Along with these clicks and all that, you're going to get page likes. After two or three shirt successes, you might have three, four, five thousand uh, fans on a certain page and that's an asset that you can use you can send traffic from this fan page to your new shirts to your old shirts to affiliate products to an email list whatever it may be this is a very lucrative asset that's being built now as you can see in our picture we have 222 pages going right now um, we have 13 niches that were dialed in on this week but we have the 209 other ones that are uh that are out there and have so many likes. I mean, our accountants one only has 31 likes, but we've only launched one shirt in that months ago. Um, some of these have 500, some of them have 1,000, some of them have 5,000. Once we hit about 5,000 mark, we always start managing our fan pages and sending traffic through there. Since we have so many pages, I don't bother with all of them. Um, at one point, I definitely will once I have someone who can handle all that. But right now, we're on a limited employee structure the way I've got social media. It's not our main focus. <clears throat> so you definitely need to be posting to your fan page um, with just meme pic pictures, social media pictures, pictures of your products, sending them to the Teespring page. Have your own e-commerce store sales page set up. Have Sunfrog shirt affiliate links in there, whatever it may be. This is traffic that you can use. Now, for a niche that we have dialed in, let's say the you know the coal miner niche we do very well with, like I said, so we're gonna do five messages per day. Three of those niche three of those messages are gonna be niche picks. So it might be a coal miner meme or you know, some pretty scenery for that niche, whatever it may be. Those are the niche specific picks. Next off, we have one of those are going to be sending people to a promotion. 
Now you want to know what's going on in your plan. This is why we set up our schedule so we can talk about it every Monday with the team. What's going on this week? What are we launching? What's been working last week that we have carrying over this week? What's the promotion this week? What email list we got going on? These are all things that you want your social media guys to understand. You want to understand yourself when you're running it because these are the messages you're going to be posting. Keep everything correlated in line. Your social media should line up with your ads. Your social media and ads should line up with your email list. Your e-commerce store should line up with all of those. That's just kind of how they build onto each other. And it adds another effect of that 7 to 10 views before you make a sale. You know, It doesn't always come down to ads. Maybe three of those views come from the Facebook ads and a retargeting ad. Maybe one of them came from an email list promotion. Maybe three more came from the fan page organic traffic you sent. So that is how you hit that the, that 10 views before purchase without having to spend money on them every time. Now in these five messages, we also send a list builder. Once we hit a very focused niche, as I'm going to talk about in the next little section, we create email newsletters, and this is very important. This is a very powerful asset where fan pages are a great asset, but they don't have as much uh, reach potential and you know targeting traffic, the trust building as an email list would. So for those fan pages that we've sold a few shirts in, we've never really had huge winners go off, but we've maybe sold 10 shirts that each sold 15 shirts over the past year. We have maybe 1,000 likes, 2,000, 3,000 likes on that page. Then we'll start posting messages to that page as well, where we're only doing three messages per day. We won't set up an email newsletter or anything like that for those niches just to save some time because remember we're focusing on our main niches that are selling. That's where the money's at for us right now, so that's where we put our focus on. So for these other ones that have fans and ha are an asset, we'll do three messages a day. Two of those will be a niche pick and one of those will be a promotion pick. So it could be the shirt you're launching this week or if you're not even launching a shirt in that niche, then you can do affiliate promotions. It's just extra money that's sitting on the table and a lot of people leave off the table. So. So I have a three-part, three-step system for managing social media, and this is all outsourced. You know, fan pages are very easy to outsource, very inexpensive. A VA can handle this, especially when you set up in the, the system we got going here. We have step one, calendar creation. Now, let's say we want to promote, we want to set up, you know, seven days next week of fan page posts. Well, I have my guys go ahead, first step, create a schedule like this to where these are three picks a day, two, two pictures, one product, and what's happening here is we create the schedule, and this allows us to know all the information we need, need to move forward. We know what shirt we're promoting. We know what links to, to plug in. We know what how many pictures, memes, and quotes or whatever we need. And then we can, once the schedule is created, we can go find all that content. And we can go into step two and we're gather it. Now, something you want to do before you start creating a schedule, create a master product list. Okay, so all the shirts you have on hand, all the shirts that you want to sell on Sunfrog or Redbubble or whatever affiliate platform you're using, have a list of those shirts, have the pictures available in a folder, and have links for them all. So that you don't have to be out, go look for that product, find the link every time. You just have this master product list. And when you get to the actual posting part, you can just plug and play. You know, when you're creating this schedule, the pro my project lead creates a schedule, sends it to our VA. The VA knows to gather the content that fits. They know to post the links and the messages that fit. Very simple stuff. Like I said, be well versed in your promotion plans every week because that's what's going to show here. If we're having like a, a giveaway contest or something, then we want to have that going on the day we release it on the ad. Do it organically too. And then the day after, have the message say, hey, don't forget our giveaway. You know, have it all correlate together and work together. Like I said, once you have this calendar created, the next step is to go gather the content. Um, we know exactly how many pictures we need. We know what products to promote. We know everything that needs to be gathered to be posted here. So, and that's exactly what the VA will do. Now, for like 20 pages, it usually takes a few days for someone to find all the pics, especially if, if you're doing a whole month. There's a lot of programs out there that will that can help you with this um, to find content, and all that, even automatic. I like to have our guys. Uh, really be hands-on with our social media because we correlate our promotion plans so much. Um, if we're using automatic tools, then you're not going to have the effect of 
sequencing and leading into your promotion. If it's a giveaway, like I said, or a five dollar discount, we the automatic won't market that appropriately. You really want to kind of plan it out. So this is simple, you know, gather gather all the content, get the picks, get the product picks, put them in one place. We have a Google Drive folder that our VA uploads them to. Then we move on to step three, and this is just posting it. I currently use Tanner Larson's FB Post Scheduler. Um, I don't know if this is still for sale. It was, uh, I think I bought it like two, three years ago or something. Um, but it's just kind of a, a standard... Uh, mass uploading tool for our fan pages as you can see we choose an image we put this we move to the next one and at the very bottom you click submit and it submits them all there um, I've been looking at some other tools for this and definitely been look talking to a programmer to create our own custom dashboard to handle this because I have a lot of features that I'd like to see myself um, but there's a cool one meetedgar.com I've been looking at it's kind of got the automatic thing in place lets you categorize your your post um, it, it will help if you don't want to be posting this all yourself. You don't have the money to hire a VA or anything like that or an employee. That This can handle it pretty well. So that is social media, just getting it started. Our fan page is the assets we have. Next off, we want to start building email lists in our targeted effective niches. Now, email lists are where the money's at. This is really your main asset you should be building at all times. With any business you create, any product you're selling, ads are great, social media is great, all the other stuff's great, but an email list is can be consistent money, easier than anything else. The people you can continually contact, continue to sell to, continue to build that trust. So you need to be building email lists in your niches. All right, so email lists, another point, they can be used as custom audiences too. So when you're doing your ads, you can have a custom audience targeting your email list so you know those people are interested. So let's take a look at some newsletters. We have four different types of email newsletters that I use in my system. We start off with a fan page or a fan club funnel. So we have the asset of the fan page, social media fan page. Um, we know these people are fans of the niche so it just kind of makes sense to create a email newsletter that's focused on those fans. All right. What is this? Okay, so a fan club. This is an example here of our pug club. So for our pug fan page and our pug shirts, this is a simple squeeze page. Welcome to the pug club. Sign up for pug health tips, special offers, groups, whatever. This is just a fan page, a new or a newsletter that's for those that are genuine fans of the niche. This works really great with our novelty goods because. This is people who are passionate about the niche. Now remember, this isn't necessarily a sales newsletter. It's not heavy sales. We're not pushing them in to be buyers, but we're growing another asset of quality fans in the niche. It'd be like creating a lookalike audience from a fan page and dialing it in or something like that. Now for this, we like to use a pen name that's going to be the exact demographics of our target buyer, ideal buyer. From stage one and two, we know what what age, what gender, what type of people like these products, so we're gonna create a pen name who fits that, that, that setting. I said, no, promoting heavy, we're doing ideal products, t-shirts, stickers, novelty goods, um, anything pug related they're gonna love. Um, this is a great funnel to lead into our other funnels. So if on day two you do a promotion to a shirt, you could send them on day three to a discount funnel to get $10 off that shirt or something along those lines. So that is our first email newsletter. Next off, we have discount funnels. So if we have a shirt that's been selling, you know, our first shirt, we went through the first four weeks, sold well, did great. We'll set up a discount funnel in week five to get $10 off. And what this is going to do, it's going to bring in people who are much more interested in buying products. The fan club is focused on people who are fans of that niche. The discount funnel is focused on people who want $10 off the actual product. So that's the kind of a cool thing with the discount funnel is you're bringing in a little bit more buyers. Your pen name can be not, it could be the same as the fan club pen name, but it could also be a product or a service or your brand or whatever, because these people are expecting to be sold to. Once they center their email, they're expecting to be sent to the sales page with their discount. 
So it kind of brings in that little bit different of a lead. You can sell a little bit more. You can push this initial shirt, this initial offer, a little heavier than you could. As you can see in this example, we've got the freaking awesome Pig Mom shirt. That's rocking a uh, $10 discount. They enter their email. They're instantly sent to our Teespring page with the $10 off promotion code. And this pops up, you know, converts very well. Next off, we have giveaway funnels. Now, this is the same type of thing. We're going to give away products once a month. Um, in this case, you can see a free pig cell phone cover. So we have this squeeze page out there. Win your free uh, pig cell phone cover. We'll announce the winner once a month. Sign up here. Now, this is other people who are kind of in, the, in between the discount and the fan club. They're people who want products, but they're also super fans of the... the uh, the niche that didn't sign up to the newsletter to purchase, they signed up to get something free. So they're not as ideally targeted as a discount funnel to buyers, but like I said, they're that middle ground where they will buy products. And they'll especially buy that initial product that you push, especially if you're only giving one or two away a, a week or a month. You'll have a lot of other fans, a lot of other email subscribers who will want to purchase that and not wait on getting it for free. Now these are great for really building lists very quickly because everyone likes free stuff, you know. You will bring in some freebie seekers, but that it does well because you'll have that kind of general audience, that targeted audience that will uh, be interested in pig novelty gear. And you can sell shirts, you can sell other cell phone covers, all that good stuff. Now next we have the how-to funnel. And this is more for kind of information on on things this is going to kind of allow you to branch out in your niche where we started off with t-shirts but let's say we're selling a pug t-shirt those same pug owners probably a lot of them have trouble with their dog peeing in the house or eating their shoes or whatever the information is that they want to learn it's not a physical uh, product they're looking to buy it's more they're looking for information and that's where a how-to funnel comes into place every niche out there has how-to possibilities that you just have to figure out and this is just much like uh, the you know make money online niche setup that we have where you have a free video or a free guide on how to make money selling t-shirts they're on your list then you sell them more products how-to guides physical products on how to do that and that's exactly what we're doing in the how-to funnel so we have all these kind of working together where they will all be promoting similar products or the same product. Each of them have their specialty to promote, different types of pen names going, different types of audience you're pulling in, but it's all leads, assets, things that you can create custom audiences around. And every time you launch a new shirt, you send out a broadcast message to each one of these lists saying, hey, we just launched a shirt. You think, oh, I think you'll love it. And you get your sales. All right, so that is prospect list. Now we want to talk about buyers list. This is our most important asset we can possibly have. Um, treat your buyers list like gold because they are gold. They're what's going to make you money for years to come here. So that's really where Teespring has been a, a hindrance on what we did last year is that they don't allow you to collect your own leads. Now they have their own buyer messaging system that works very well. We use it every day. But the actual buyer uh, leads, we don't get to take ourselves and we don't get to really do as much as we want with it. And complete control is what we really want to have. So a buyer's list is key and that's what we're really loving, how Viral Style put that into play. And then, of course, Gear Bubble here is going to have that rocking for us. And then the e-commerce setup is, you know, that's complete control. So in these feel free to promote. These are buyers. You know they like products. You can put upsells into place. You can put combo offers. You can put related products. You can send them to your how-to products. You know, buyers lists are where it's at. Send them the information you want. Give, figure out what they want and just continue selling them stuff. So definitely put buyers lists into play as soon as possible. Now some ways that you can set up buyers lists right now. You can have Shopify set up with MailChimp. They also allow you to set up with AWeb or get response to a few others. Um, when I first put this, it was MailChimp. Um, that's how we're doing our e-commerce store. We have AWeber and Shopify, as I'll talk in the next section. But that's one way to get your buyer's leads for when anyone buys through e-commerce store. Next off, we have things like Profit Bay, which is a plugin that can associate with JVZoo as a buyer button. And then JVZoo associates with GetResponse. The problem with this, you're going to have a lot of fees going through the system. JVZoo will take their fee. PayPal will take their fee. Um, a little bit extra expenses. 
Now, next off, we have Viral Style. That allows you to have the buyers list. You can set up uh, Get Response, I think AWeber, MailChimp, all the major ones. Uh, MailChimp seems to be the best working one that I found with Viral Style so far, mostly because the way the system's set up with Viral Style, if you have Get Response set up, I know it does a double confirmation when they buy, and that's just that extra step that cuts down on your leads where MailChimp won't have that double confirm process and you get every buyer coming in. Now, and like I said, Teespring has their buyer messaging system and Represent also has their buyer messaging system that you can use and definitely use that every day if you're using those platforms. So that is email lists. Those are definitely gold. You want those in place as soon as possible. Next off, we have e-commerce. And this is becoming my best friend here in 2015 because of, like I said, complete control and it's brand building. I'm building a brand instead of I'm building product sales. You know, we're not worrying about finding 25 new winners every week like we were all last year. Now I can find one winner a week. It doesn't matter because I've got 35 shirts on my e-commerce store that are selling a few every day from social media, from email lists, from our ads dripping in whatever your traffic source is out there. And this is where you can really expand on those traffic sources because you have your brand. <clears throat> and really the, the main thing here is this is margins. You know, Teespring, all those different platforms are going to have their own markup on products because they want to make profit too. Here we have a lot more control of who we use, um, what's going on. We do have to handle a lot more things. Um, not a lot more things, but a few more things that may take up time but the margins end up being better in your favor especially when we're outsourcing like we all should be all right so on top of margins like i said we can really expand on our traffic sources we just have fan pages and email lists to start with our ads so we're going to move into full out social media anything you have on facebook can be posted on pinterest can be posted on twitter can be posted on Google+. Plus. Those are all traffic sources that are different than our fan page, and they'll have different buyers, and you'll be able to reach more people with really the same amount of effort. Now, platforms like Pinterest and Twitter are starting to offer advertising as well, and Pinterest ads are kind of ideal for what we sell, um, if you think about it, because that's really where people share this type of stuff, and that's where our ideal women buyer group really hangs out a lot. So those are, I've been playing with those just recently a lot more, a lot of fun, um, seem to be working well, and it's just another traffic source we're going to be able to go out there. Now on top of that, we can look into Google traffic, AdWords. AdWords are something that starting, a lot of guys are doing very well with. We're just starting to implement with our e-commerce. SEO, that's gold when it comes to your e-commerce store. This is your brand, your website, so you can get it ranked on the Google search engines for like best swimmer shirt, you know, whatever. Uh, and you'll have organic traffic coming in from Google on a regular basis, which is pretty cool. And then on top of that, you have YouTube, where you can actually have ads, you can have organic traffic from videos. If you look at the pie shirt here, they created a video that shows the shirt, and pretty much the video just has some background music and a few text pop-ups that explain what the hell this trigonometry thing is. Um, and this had, as you can see, 3,029 people like this, 1,764 shares. I bet that made some money, you know? And you can advertise this on Facebook as well. These are other advertising strategies that you can start to expand on in your e-commerce store. And a lot of what I'll be talking about in the workshop, um, just because it's kind of, it's, I'm three months in on most of this and we're just figuring out the tweaks and really things are starting to blow up because you're not just doing Facebook ads. Facebook sometimes has a bad day. Sometimes they change their algorithm and your whole thing screws up or sometimes they're doing maintenance and your reach is horrible. You know, when those days kind of come around, if you have all these other traffic sources going, it doesn't really matter. It's not that big of a hit. So let's move on to our Shopify process. All right, so we have multiple stores going right now. Um, I hit a bunch of different niches. I like to create a store per industry um, so I can branch out to other products. I have one Shopify store for T-shirts exclusively. It's just a T-shirt brand. We're selling all our T-shirts on here. We're getting our buyer's leads from each one. We have upsells in place, all that type of stuff. 
Uh, after stage two of the shirt, they're moved to the twin ter- or the uh, the e-commerce store where we're going to have our shirts listed, and then we can sell the drip feed from there. Now, also, I have a a new Shopify store that I created around beard stuff. As you saw, probably in recent pictures, I've been growing a beard out lately, and it's mostly just for this beard brand. Where we're selling balms and oils and combs and uh, maintenance tools and all that type of stuff. Now, what's cool is we have those products we can expand expand on, but we can also sell beard T-shirts there, and we can send them to our T-shirt e-commerce store to sell them there. And then we have a dog Shopify store where we sell everything dog-related: bowls, collars, leashes. Um, toys, you know, all that type of stuff. And obviously, shirts are very big in that as well. <clears throat> so when we have our Shopify store up, what we're doing is we launch our 25 shirts in a week in stage one. Once we launch those, we move them all over to the e-commerce store. Now, this doesn't mean we're going to be advertising them all with all these this traffic strategies, but it means we have a large database of t-shirts that people can buy. Because a lot of these Shirts that only sell 10 in a campaign or something, they'll randomly sell, they'll randomly work as a, a bulk order or something like that. And that's just extra money coming in, even though we're just sending traffic and paid advertising to our main sellers. So once we've made it through stage two, like I said, we have the demographics down. We know the age, we know the gender, we know the styles they like, all that different stuff. So what we can do here is we can start creating an ad. Okay, and this ad is just going to be like 10 to 15 to 25 dollars a day. Our ideal demographics look alike, audience is going at a slow pace, but we're just kind of dripping sales in here. We don't want to, I don't like to take over the new launches I have coming out every week. Like I said, we have the new launches if it's a unique design, we really want that to skyrocket, and we don't want to overshadow it with our old design by bumping budgets too much on that. It's really great just to have a few sales coming in on each of your shirts. When you get 20, 30, 40 shirts coming and each of them are making two, three, four sales a day, it happens very it adds up very quickly. And that's just from paid advertising. When you start adding in the organic stuff, it's just like skyrockets. So this is our example layout we have. You know, play around with the Shopify themes that you're using. This one right now we're using, I think it's called Focal. Um, 6% conversion rates on the sales page, not bad at all, very good. Um, guys I've been talking to that I'm trying to learn from, they're doing like 9, 10% on the, the sales page, but also their ad strategies are a little bit more advanced than I were. We're just, our main focus is Facebook ads and we're adding the organic uh, or the organics in there doing well, but we're really still figuring out the AdWords, the Pinterest, all those things. Where a lot of them are, are making sales, but they're not converting as high as we want to. We're also playing around with our look, our themes, um, seeing what's going to work for us uh, better than this focal, if any, stuff like that. But very simple stuff. Products listed. We have related products on the bottom of the page, you know, the, the essentials. So let's talk about what we need to have in place with our Shopify store. Probably some things that you're not going to be thinking about with Teespring or the Stage 1, Stage 2 process. First off, most important thing to have in place, customer support. This is where when you're building a brand and you're running everything, this is really where you can make a most impact almost on your business, I'd say. Just because you're going to have a lot of you know, refunds. People are maybe going to get the wrong size or the wrong design. They're going to want it taken care of. The quicker you you comply with this request, the more likely they are to put a good word in for you for the next shirt you launch or then the people that want to buy a shirt for you or even to buy from you again. Now, we handle this very simply. I have a VA, a virtual assistant. I use Zendesk, which is a dashboard set up, Zendesk.com. Um, to handle customer support questions, and I create an FAQ of the most common questions we hear from buyers. Now, my VA has this FAQ. Every email that comes in, she answers immediately, and if it's not on the FAQ list, then she'll send me an email. I'll give her an answer. She adds it on the FAQ. So she just has this list of kind of standard replies that she's going to put in, and we like our customer support people to be as friendly as possible. Like I said, we want people to like us here, and this is where you know, the refunds and the returns and all that stuff, this is where they are most likely not to like us. And soon we're going to be putting in a little toll-free number that they can call, have a little live operator with the same FAQ, um, just be answering questions and things like that to give that professionalism look. The more professional you are, the better customer support will appear and the bigger your brand will be able to go. 
Now, on top of customer support, we have upsells. This is a biggie, guys. This is where you really kill it. This is where, like I said, I'm excited about Gear Bubble, and I was excited about Viral Style. They did well with this um, offering upsells because you know if you ever sell products, you know that upsells really can convert at a 20, 30 percent conversion rate pretty easily, and that's huge when you're making a sales every day. If you make three sales a day um, at, let's say, $50 a piece, let's say every product you sell is $50, you make three sales, one of those is going to buy the upsell, and instead of making 50, $150 a day, you're making $200 a day that easily. Without doing anything else, all you're doing is showing another product. This works very well with any product out there, even with our T-shirts, where we'll have... And especially when we know our best sellers. When we have our list of best sellers, we have the one, let's say it was that Pig Mom shirt I showed you earlier, um, the freaking awesome Pig Moms, the initial one they buy, and then we have maybe a freaking awesome Pig Dad as the upsell. Now, this is a very great place to, to offer that cross relationship um, offer because if someone's a mom, there there's probably a dad. If someone's a wife, there's definitely a husband. If you know that type of stuff that we can do, it also works great if it's a second uh, bestseller pig shirt that's not dad related but two mom related shirts. You know, so upsells are great. Have them in place always. They will boost your margins like crazy. And if you have the right upsells in place, you'll have like two, three, four orders uh, or products purchased every order. And like I said, really, really boost what you're making per customer. Now, with Shopify, there's lots of apps out there to handle this. I'm using the app called Product Upsell. It has a monthly fee, um, but it's easily paid for within the first day every month. Um, because upsells, they just add 20 30% every day. I mean, just think about that instantly. Just one piece in there adds 30% to your bottom line. Huge. Next off, buyer list. Talked a lot about this. Shopify supports a lot of different autoresponders. Get response, Aweber, MailChimp. Um, I'm using Aweber with them just because I'm familiar with them more than MailChimp. And Get Response uh, doesn't allow me to separate buyer's list per shirt purchase. So with the Get Response buyer list in Shopify, you're only allowed to create one single list, and everyone who buys off of your Shopify store will be added to that buyer list. Now, I want it to where if someone buys my freaking awesome Pig Mom shirt, I want to have an autoresponder that sells them other Pig Mom shirts and cell phone covers and all that stuff. So Aweber and MailChimp allows us to dial that in so that we can target into that group. And that's really important. I also like to have a general discount buyer email list. So like on my e-commerce store, I'll have them be able to sign up. Um, and Or when they purchase, they'll be added to that general list. And it's just a discount list. So every week, we'll send them the best three deals on the, the, the site. So Or a discount coupon code. Every two weeks, we'll be like, you can get $10 here. Just go to our e-commerce store and, and enter the discount code HAPPY. And anything they purchase, they'll get that percentage or that, that money discount off. And this is another way to connect to the audience, another way to get them into the door. And then also, the discount coupons, we use these often. After someone buys, usually on the welcome email, I'll put that same same message like that. It'll just say, someone bought the freaking awesome Pig Mom shirt they're on the pig mom buyer list the first thing will say hey you can get five dollars off this awesome pig dad shirt here you know just get them back in the store get them buying all that type of stuff next thing is retargeting and conversion pixels this is we already talked about this a lot um you know different than teespring setting up retargeting conversion pixels takes a little bit of code to put in the, uh, the right places but it's the same exact thing we're doing um, we want these in place so that we can create lookalike audiences, retarget with our sequences, and all that type of stuff. All right, so last thing here is we want to have easy order processing. You know, with Teespring and all those, Gear Bubble, the best thing about this is when a sale's made, it's made. You don't have to handle the fulfillment, no customer support, nothing like that. All you have to have is create the designs, send the traffic, you make money, you're golden. With us, with the, the Shopify setup, we're handling customer support, obviously, but when a shirt sale is made, we need to go buy that shirt and send it to the right person. Now, we initially started this just by drop shipping. 
um, through like Sunfrog. We would mark up our prices uh, on the the e-commerce store, drop down whatever our design price was on Sunfrog, best margins possible there. Um, but this is a little pain in the ass to be able to do that. So now what we use is Scalable Press, and there's a few other platforms out there. Uh, Printful, uh, can't remember media something. Anyway, Scalable Press allows you to easily uh, integrate your Shopify API with their printing service. So when you have your t-shirts listed on Shopify, you can go into Scalable Press, set up your account, set up your Shopify, and Scalable Press will automatically see what designs are on your Twin Turtle or, or your e-commerce store. Um, when you do this, you're going to link them all together so that when a purchase is made, the Scalable Press automatically will send, uh, or Shopify will automatically send Scalable Press the address, the size, the color, um, all that information that you need and that you'd have to manually plug in to make your order. So this is very helpful through the day, just the end of the day, all I gotta do is go into Scalable Press and click the order button for today and it automatically charges me, automatically prints everything in the 72 hours, ships it out, handles everything. I think you can even white label your, your shirts here where you can have like uh, something added into your shipping so that it's a little piece of paper that gives a discount code or a thank you card or a survey or you know other marketing tactics that you can put into play here. Complete control, guys. It's where really where it's at. <clears throat> so with Scalable Press, we have pretty decent margins. Um, with a single shirt sale at $25, uh, we're looking at it's going to cost us about $15 if we're ordering one shirt at a time to have it printed, shipped, and all that stuff. So at $25 uh, sales price, we're making $10 a shirt if we've only sold one of those shirts at a time. And if we get up to 10 orders, then we're dropping down to 10, uh, 10, 10 bucks to have shipping and, and printing and handling, all that type of stuff. So our margin drops the more we order. And once you start selling thousands of shirts and stuff, um, you can get even better margins where you're looking at like six, seven dollars a shirt um, to really cut down. That's really the goal here is cut down margins, um, make more profit per sale, and that's exactly what we're doing. Whereas, you know, if you sell one shirt, on Teespring, at the same twenty-five dollars, you're going to make like six dollars profit um, until you hit that fifty mark or that twenty-five mark or whatever as it continues to rise up. But we make that ten dollars uh, or fifteen dollars right away on our scalable press and our Shopify, so it is a little bit better margins. And I like to have my guys process orders every like two three days, um, just so that we can hit our bulk orders a little bit more. So we're ordering at least ten or more because out of ten. You start to get drop down prices, 100, 1,000, stuff like that. Now, Scalable Press has very good shipping quality, and they have a lot of different styles um, that you can play around with. It's just really about getting the initial setup in place. All right, so let me look at questions. Printing in blanks. Aaron, I like the quality of printing. I like their the, how they handle it. They I've not had any complaints about uh, the quality. That, like I said, they have a lot of different styles, a lot of different quality types um, that you can choose from. A lot of different brands you can choose from to give your customers exactly what they want. Um, the hard thing, the only thing that really sucks with Scalable Press is actually linking each shirt together. This is something we have our VA do, but when we first created the store, we had like 200 shirts, 300 shirts that we had to link up, and you got to link every size, every style, and it's just a kind of a two, three week, it was a two, three week process of clicking the same button. So that was really, the, was the only thing that hindered us, but if you're just starting, you got like five shirts, it will take you like 30 minutes to do it. So it's not that's the only only thing with that. All right, so let's answer some questions. Feel free to start asking questions now. I'm pretty sure I just covered all the content. I will talk about the four week workshop after I answer these questions. Actually, let me talk about that first. Just get out of the way. So pretty much what you just saw. That's what I'm covering in this four week workshop. This is going to start April first. It's going to be four webinars. Um, you're going to have 
lifetime access to my private group called ROI where you can communicate with me every day, ask questions, join the group. If you want to go check it out right now, there's no sales page. It's just like a buy button, a little bit of information. It's at tmaniacs.com slash workshop. Um, the starting price tag we have this at is $4.97 on Monday or Sunday night, whenever I get back from San Diego, this will be bumped up to $9.97. I can guarantee you that. I want this to be my end-all product to t-shirts that I can just continue to tweak and improve. And pretty much what we're going to go through in this workshop is everything you saw here, except in extreme detail, pretty much everything I did not answer, you'll get to see live, created, pretty much right in front of you. So week one, we're going to get into the foundation. We're going to be talking about getting that rebrandable system going, making money with Teespring, viral style, gear bubble, finding those niches that are going to work for you. Finding those first two or three focus niches is really the key. That's key of week one is we want to really get those that are going to sell for us over the long term. Because once you have two or three niches, you, it doesn't really matter. You, you're making money every month anyways. You might only be making $5,000 a month, but that's $5,000 a month from those three niches and you can always outreach to more and expand on those. So pretty much week one, I'll be covering everything. Uh, week two, scaling. Now I covered that today in the, the stage two, but like you can probably tell, there's huge amounts of variation of this and a lot of different things going on. Hard to explain in a two, three hour webinar we're pushing here, but in a week of covering it and a webinar focused on it exclusively, we're really going to be able to see that. Plus, I'll be able to show you a lot of different uh, live examples. And that's really the workshop's going to help a lot. You're going to see actual things that are selling right then. Um, during this workshop, I want to show you exactly what I'm doing that week, every week of the business. You know, I'm going to have to ex definitely have a little trust factor with my, my buyers so that they don't try and copy what we're doing because that's going to screw up our numbers. And, you know, we want to show you results so that you can see exactly how this is done. Um, but week two will be all about scaling, just really diving into that. Over the past three months, six months, I have been improving this drastically. My ad system really sucked in 2014. It was just the initial, like I had been teaching, $25 a day, double it every day until it evens out. Now, as you can see, custom lookalike audiences, heavy-duty retargeting. We're doing fan page lookalikes, custom audiences from email lists, all of this crazy stuff to scale so that we're selling a 1,000 shirts. Um, and that's what we'll be covering week two. Week three, we're going to be talking about the long-term setup in place. And that's going to be really a lot about the e-commerce store, Shopify. There's a lot of walkthrough videos I'm going to have to show you on that because it's, you know, you control it all. So it makes a little bit more hassle on what you need to set up and put in place, but it's all worth it in the end. And that's what we'll be covering there, getting the upsells, the buyers list, um, the retargeting, conversion, pixels, all that type of stuff with this week three uh, data. Now week four, we're going to get into the pretty much how to just let it run for you from there. So we're going to talk about a traffic explosion, expanding past Facebook ads in your initial organic. We'll get into the SEO, the AdWords, the Pinterest, all that good stuff that we are adding in to build our brand and really make it explode. We're also going to be talking about outsourcing the whole thing in this section so that you can, you know, not have to do any of it yourself, which is really the best part of this all. So once again, Right now, $4.97, guys, you want to hop on this. It's a four-week-long program, really going to be intense. I want to show you guys everything. You can find that at tmaniacs.com slash workshop um, Monday morning, Sunday night. It's going to jump up to double that. We'll have it at $997. So you definitely want to hop on there right now if you if this is something you're, you're into. So now I'll get to questions. So go ahead and ask questions. All right. All right, Johnny. Will you teach hiring staffing for this stuff? Yes, that will be week four, like I just mentioned. Um, yeah, we have a team of like four right now that are in-house. Um, it's, it's tough. Outsourcing is tough because you're going to go through some shitty employees, and that's really what I've noticed. We had a hindrance not only in our, our advertising uh, in the beginning of the year here where we kind of hit that ceiling of 50,000, 60,000. Um, and then what was really holding us back was the advertising, and I had two guys that just were not pulling their weight, and that happens. That happens often, um, and you 
you'll go through some people, but when you have the right system in place and you know what you're looking for, you can find some really A players. And that's really the key there. And that's what I'm going to help you out with the hiring and staffing because I know that is a very difficult part of it all. All right, what type of ROI am I seeing on my Pinterest ads? You know, Louis, uh, Louis I'm not, I'm not well-versed in it enough to have great data. We're seeing positive returns. Um, but probably only in the you know 50 to 100 percent ROI at most type of range. I'm very just starting to play around with this. I have a lot of mentors that I have training me, so by week four I should have that down pretty packed. We're really putting in the play hardcore um, this upcoming week, and then this event I'm going to in San Diego. I'm gonna be able to you know chit chat with all the guys who do this on the million dollar level. All right, Jeffrey, is there a replay? Yeah, I'll be sending that out tomorrow. All right. Love to see you in there, Ron. All right, where we're at. I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Um, but you ask, it seems like launching Teespring at the first stage is just to find promising niches worth dominating in later stages. That's exactly right. At all of 2014, we use the platforms exclusively. 2015, the goal is long-term setup. Because who knows where Teespring will be in a year? They might be gone, you know? And then what are you going to do? So you don't want to just put all your assets or all your eggs in one basket. You want to have the, you want to at least be holding the basket yourself. Um, so we use Teespring to do our outreach because we can cut on our margins there. We don't have to waste so much time setting up on our e-commerce store and all the retargeting, the upsells, and the buyers list. We use Teespring for that. Now, I'm probably going to be switching over to Gearbubble exclusively. I can pretty much guarantee it just because of what Don's offering on that platform, guys. The upsells, the buyers list. That's the thing with Teespring. We're doing our outreach system, but we're not generating those buyers leads. We still don't get those emails. So with Gearbubble, we're going to be able to collect those emails, have upsells in place right away so we can test out what other shirts might work as an upsell, what other products work as an upsell, so that when we put it on our e-commerce store, we'll already know what works. So that's like, yes, the first round, stage one, is that net, that wide net that you're looking for all the niches, you're looking for designs, you're looking for the upsells that work, and you're looking to build a long-term asset. Even if you have on round one, if you can collect buyer's leads, even if you're breaking even or losing money on your first 10 shirts, you've probably still collected you know, 100 new email leads that you can send to the next shirt, and some of them will buy. Yes, the beer, gear bubble has buyer lead integration, so that will have, it's pretty much going to have everything you need, everything I've seen at least. Thanks, Mitch. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Lewis, how do you find outsources, outsourcers and what questions you ask to find good ones? Really depends on the position. I'm right now in a huge kick to hire in-house. I like building my team here in Nashville. I have a horrible problem of not emailing my workers. Like I'll have a VA who I'll forget I have a VA, or I have like three of them, and I'll forget one of them's not working. And it's just because I like to have the guy sitting across from me at the table, and I can think of it. Oh, hey, do this, Sam. You know. So for my outsourcers, I'm using Craigslist and uh, you know all the job hunting type of things. But you can definitely find Elance Odesk. Post on Facebook. Look in the groups of Teespring and Facebook advertisers and people that do this and you can easily find some outsourcers uh, very very effective alright Joseph could you just rehash the master list one more time um, are you Joseph are you talking about master list of products or the master list of interest while I'm waiting for that I'll move on to the next question alright Merrick asked do you need to use a conversion pixel to get the Facebook data yes you absolutely need the conversion pixel because if you don't have that, you're not going to be able to line up the data with who's purchasing. Um, now, on conversion pixels, not every one of your sales will fire. Really, only about like 30 to 40 percent of your sales will actually count as a conversion pixel, but we go by the numbers. You can set up things like tracking tags, or you can use something like Improvly, which is a tracking. Uh, provider to see which exact uh, ads are converting. Um, we're doing so many shirts, we don't even set that up. I just 
Just use a conversion pixel and go buy it. All right, so could you rehash the master list of interests one more time? Okay, the basic system is we're going out. When we don't have any idea about a niche, we want to make a master list. That means every freaking interest I can find, I want it on this list. We start broad by looking at very broad terms in the interest. So for swimming, we talked about swimming or freestyle swimming. That opens up all the different angles to that, that niche. Then we start plugging in these interests one by one, looking at the different variations and the suggestions that come up on our audience insights. Now once we have a solid list, we can start to categorize these, plug these categories back in, and see what suggestions come up, because that'll be more related to those categories. We also do Google searches for things like the best books, the best websites, the best forums, the best associations, uh, the best products, the best brands, the best championships, all that different stuff. We're going to search on Google, take those results, plug them into Audience Insights and see which ones are interest. This is just different ways to continue to add interest to your list. Um, so that's pretty much the way you go about it there. We just want a master list, a gigantic list of as many interests as possible. All right, Howard, what do you consider good interaction on ads? Good interaction in the first $20, I'm looking at 10% click-through rating, um, 300 likes, well, I don't even care about likes. It's more shares and comments. You know, 10 to 20 comments and half as many shares as I have likes, or at least a fourth as many shares I have likes. You know, um, that's really good interaction. You can definitely see sales with less interaction. I've had plenty of 5% click through ratings do well, but it, typically in the first $20, $40, you're going to get the best interaction. Um, the best numbers and then it'll start to kind of dwindle down until you uh, retarget that ad and focus in your demographics. All right, what is considered a big interest by Merrick? Um, were I a big interest, I don't like to have a reach over a million when I have a total reach of over a million in my initial ad. Um, when I start doing lookalike audiences, I don't mind. Um, but the initial PP ad or any individual ad, I like to keep it between 300,000 to a million total reach. And that doesn't mean that those won't work. It's just that, remember, we're trying to find the ideal group of interest that are in, that we can use in the initial setting. All right, Marwan asks, I have a lot of time I'm losing in my Facebook ads. What do I need to help? Now, success comes down to design and your targeting. So if you're not having success, if you're having very bad click-through ratings, bad engagement, you're going to want to look at those two things. Look at your design. Do people like it? If it's getting a lot of clicks when you do an ad but no sales, then they like the design, they or they like the message. They like what you're doing there. They might not like the design very much, and your targeting is probably pretty decent. Um, now, if you're getting low interaction on your ad, not much clicks, um, you know, stuff like that, but you're getting sales, or no, you're not getting sales, <coughs> then it's your targeting. You know, these are the two things you really just want to figure out, and that's why we go with. If you have a, a failure, look at that failure, and the next time you do a launch, if it's the same design you want to retweak, if you're going to launch the same design, then you re, then tweak the, the interest you use. If you're going to launch a new design, then you can try out the same interest twice in a row, but if that second design that that just doesn't take off, then look at your interest on round three. You know, Those are the two things you really want to get going. Then if you have a good design, then definitely look at your interest and go through our, our system I, I explained. All right, for ad images, do you use the Teespring ad editor? Um, no, I just Photoshop. I have a graphic designer. I, like most of ours, I literally will just save the shirt image off of Teespring, and that is my ad. It's usually no different than that. So, yeah, it's very simple stuff. All right, Aaron asks, is it true that interest in all lower case is what remains of precise interest? Um, I think I answered that before, but I don't know that one, honestly. Um, I know it was like that for a while. I'm not sure if it, that's still true today. Um, I don't know. 
white background on my ads? Yes, in most cases, until we start getting the retargeting where we're doing all that heavy variation testing, then we, then we change it up. So is there any harm to starting your first campaign at $25 or should I start at $20 and move up? No harm in $25. You know, that did very well for us in 2014, all through the year. I've been setting up mine at that $10 start because I'm thinking long term. Uh, it seems the more time you give, the less you spend on certain ads, the better Facebook is going to be able to optimize that ad. You don't want to bump up too quickly. You want to... When you start getting into advanced Facebook advertising, things I can't even get into because it's so freaking much and stuff I don't even understand at that level, um, but it has a lot to do with total reach of your, your ad. So if your ad has 500,000 total reach with all your interests, then you really are going to, you'll, you'll never want to have a budget of over like $100 or $50 for that reach. Now, if you have a reach of an ad that has like, 1.5 million then you can bump that up to 250 max and this is the part I was talking about when you bump up your budget too much Facebook's gonna show crap traffic well we want to slowly and gradually move into our max budget per reach uh, scenario and as you can probably tell as I'm just explaining this it's a little bit complicated um, until you kind of see the numbers and stuff like that and like I said I'm still playing around with that stuff as well Right now, I'm playing around with how many ads I want in a, or how many ad sets I want in a single campaign. Previously, like I said, with the PP ad, it's just one campaign with PP as the original ad. And if I separate interest and age and gender, I would just create ad sets under that one campaign. So we'd have like 30 or 40 or 50 or even 100 ad sets in one campaign, and that worked out pretty good. But we're starting to notice and, and hear around the grapevine of these guys doing, you know. 100,000 a day in ads, um, it's best to kind of dial that down. Have three, four, five ad sets max per campaign and separate it by groups. And this just kind of allows Facebook's algorithm to optimize better. And these are all, like I said, very advanced uh, kind of topics that we, we don't even need to think about for what we're doing right now. As you start to improve and get it down, you're making some money, then definitely start looking at those type of things. I have just tested different background colors. Um, in pretty much 95% of the time, white background has always produced better. $25 shirt price. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I've seen no conversion drop from bumping up to $25 in my shirt price compared to $20. Um, sometimes a campaign will drop it down to $22 with a discount offer or something like that, but that's about as far as we go. Plus, it just had $5 extra profit, so it kind of makes up on the lower conversions. Yeah, Cecil uh, mentioned here, if you pay attention to your post comments, people will tell you when they want a hoodie, tank, etc. Definitely be interacting on your, your post. Always interact on the comments. And, and not you don't have to reply to everyone, but reply to ones that make sense. If people are asking questions, answer the question. Someone says, how do I buy this? Then say, click the green button and send them the link. You know, that's simple. But always be looking at your comments and seeing because people will tell you, you know, oh, yeah, like I want a tank top in this. Or I love that design, but I really hate that picture on it. You know, that type of stuff you're going to see through the comments. So pay attention every night. Have your guy going through there. All right, Merrick asks, how do you give free shipping on the first 20 orders? Well, with Teespring, we're just using the promotion code, um, PR equals whatever your free shipping is, and then you can turn it off after you've made 20 sales. Um, and really, we don't even turn it off. We just say the first 20 orders, and I've not had anyone comment on it yet. The free shipping does add a little bit of conversion rate for us, we've noticed, but it's not necessary. All right, how much should we expect to pay a VA for this type of work? Uh, you know, always expect price to be correlated with quality. I have some VAs I pay $400 a month who work 40 hours a week for me, and they do great. It's a very simple task, collecting pictures for my fan pages, collecting or posting T-shirts to Teespring. You know, very simple work that you can dial down step by step. Those lower-end VAs, and then you know you got VAs that are uh, 
kind of the normal priced employees where you're spending three, four, five thousand dollars a month. But when you're outsourcing, make sure that the people you're paying are making you money back. That's the whole thing here. So if they're not making you money, uh, you either have to improve how you have the system set up for them to follow or you need to fire them because they're not pulling their weight. All right. Uh, I talked about that. All right, best way to monitor my campaigns, uh, just like I showed in stage two there about the reporting. Um, use reports, set up those stats like I had it, and you're good to go. Craig asks, isn't it hard to do targeting for so many different niches? Um, definitely. I mean, it's, like I said, it takes time. But after you have done that initial um, targeting, or that initial research that might take you three, four hours the first time, you have this gigantic niche list or interest list that you can go back to and you don't really ever touch it again until you have one that really takes off and starts making money for you. All right, can you set a promo code to end after so many orders? No, not uh, automatically. You'd have to do it manually. Um, but like I said, all it takes on Teespring is turning the promotion code on and off with a simple button, just like you would an ad. Lewis asks, have you tried using Ad Espresso to monitor your ads? Yes, I have used Ad, I have used Ad Espresso and I've used Quaya. Um, they're both good. It's, you know, they help speed up the process. Um, I don't use either much anymore. Just it's I find it it's not really necessary for us. As long as you've got the power editor down, um, you can really crank it uh, as far as timing goes. Ad Expresso does have that nice little interest intersect tool um, implemented, but Audience Intersects works just fine for that as well. All right, for the promotion code, would I have to change the link the ad uses? Now, after you turn it off, you can still have the same promotion code. It just won't pop up that green screen as long as you you have it. You can really, on your Teespring links, like the, the tracking code after your Teespring link is question mark, variable one equals variable two. So you can change variable one to whatever you want, variable two, whatever you want. For the promotion code, it's question mark, PR equals, and then whatever your promotion code you created. Now, if you put your Teespring campaign question mark and you put whatever you want after it it's still gonna go to that same link it's just anything after the question mark lets the browser and the server know alright track this where's this coming from look at this variable uh, so that's about it alright so that looks about it for questions oh never mind. How much should I set the price of a female and kid shirt if I set a male shirt at $24.95? Um, you know, I set them around the same. Just uh, if it's a female women's fitted, we'll maybe do $27.95 because they cost a little bit more than the basic. A kids, you know, we're not really using kid shirts that often to explode our campaigns. It's just kind of extra sales. So anything extra, I count good for the kids, unless it's a kids focused campaign. Um, so we'll set those. You know, sometimes around $20, 20, 20 to twenty-five dollars the kids. Sometimes a little cheaper, just because it is a kid shirt. People expect to pay less for kids clothing. When should I use a tracking code? Whenever you want, Merrick. It's really up to you. I used to use them all the time, but I would use tracking codes and conversion pixels, and I would use both pieces of data to really track everything. But I, honestly, I just use conversion pixels now, and it works just just fine. All right, guys, so we're just closing off on three hours here, so I'd say that's probably pretty good. <laughs> um, once again, if you guys are interested in joining the four-week workshop, I would love to have you in there. I really, I'm really excited about it. I think we're gonna, it's going to be awesome. Um, I want to, like I said, show you everything I'm doing um, when I 100% expect to make over a million dollars this year with this exact system I'll be showing you. So it's... Uh, you know, I started this a year ago, so that's kind of shows you how quickly you can do this um, yourself. So once again, guys, if you want to go join that, it's at tmaniacs.com/workshop. 
I'd love to see you in there. Um, once again, thank you guys so much for joining me tonight. This has really been a great little webinar. I'm glad to have you on here. Glad to help you guys out. Hopefully you got a lot from it. And uh, you know, anyone who's going to be at Marketing Mayhem, look forward to seeing you. So if you guys don't have any more questions, I hope you guys uh, have a great weekend. So hit me up on Facebook or on my email if you have anything that pops in your mind in the future here. And all right, guys. Everyone have a great one.